the Lord Privy Seal, I beg to move the first motion, standing in his name on the order paper. The question is, my Lords, that this motion be agreed to. As many as are of that opinion shall say content. content. To the contrary, not content. To the contents have it. The second business of the House, Earl Howe. On behalf of my noble friend, the Lord Privy Seal, I beg to move the second motion, standing in his name on the order paper. Uh, my Lords, it may assist the House if I set out the plan for this Bill, agreed in the usual channels. Uh, the Bill's second reading will take place today, with the debate in the name of my noble friend, Baroness Vere, on the Spring Budget. Uh, noble Lords have until 11am tomorrow, that's Tuesday the 19th of March, to table amendments for the committee stage of the Bill and should approach the Public Bill Office in the usual way. The committee stage and all remaining stages will take place tomorrow. If there is a need to have further substantive changes, uh, uh, stages, I beg your pardon, after committee, these will be announced in the Chamber in the usual way. Lords, the question this motion be agreed to, as many as are of that opinion shall say content. Uh, to the contrary, not content. The contents have it. My Lords, we now come to some instruments previously debated in Grand Committee, and the first one is Gender Recognition, Approved Countries and Territories and Saving Provision, Order 2023, Baroness Barron. My Lords, I beg to move the motion standing in my name on the order paper. The question is that this motion be agreed to, as many as are of that opinion shall say content. Uh, to the contrary, not content. The contents have it. We now come to National Minimum Wage Amendment Number 2, Regulations 2024. Lord Offord of. I'm so sorry. Lord Harlick. My Lords, on behalf of my noble friend, Lord Offord of Garville, and with the Leader of the House, I beg to move the motion standing in his name on the order paper. The question is that this motion be agreed to. As many as are of that opinion shall say content. Content. The contrary, not content. The contents have it. We now come to an order not previously debated in Grand Committee, Criminal Justice Act 2003, Suitability for Fixed Term Recall, Order 2024. Lord Bellamy. My Lords, I beg to move that the House approves the draft Criminal Justice Act 20, 2003, Suitability for Fixed Term Recall, Order 2024. My Lords, in October 2023, my right honourable friend, the Lord Chancellor, said in the other place that the government would review the use of recall to ensure that the prison system is working effectively and how to manage safely any risk posed by offenders while not having people in prison any longer than necessary. And that is the purpose of this statutory instrument. Recall, as your Lordships know, is a preventative measure that's available to the probation service to bring an offender managed on licence in the community following release from prison back into custody. There are, my lords, two kinds of recall. The first one is what is known as fixed term recall, which is a, for a period of 14 days if the offender has been sentenced to a, a, a sentence of less than 12 months, or 28 days if they're serving a sentence of over 12 months. That is fixed term recall. The other sort of recall is standard recall, where offenders are uh, recalled to prison, they remain in custody until the end of their sentence unless earlier released by the parole board. Unfortunately, pressures on the parole board mean that it is sometimes quite a long time before that prisoner's further release comes up for consideration. And in the case of offenders that are already serving less than 12 months, the delays in the parole board might mean that the parole board doesn't get round to considering their case before they're due for release anyway. So that means in the case of offenders of less than 12 months, a recall is quite a severe consequence. My Lords, the situation is that between 2017 and 2023, the number of people in prison on recall has risen by about 85%. And in that period, there's been a major decline in fixed term recalls, 20% in general and 27% for those offenders who are serving less than 12 months. 
So the purpose of this statutory instrument is to rebalance that situation and to mandate the use of fixed term recall for lower level offenders, those on less than 12 months, subject to certain exceptions, which I shall uh, come to, so that in the case of those offenders, they automatically, they're automatically recalled for 14 days and then re-released. Of course, they then remain on license until the end of their, um, until the, until the end of their custodial uh, period being served out uh, in the community. So that is the essential purpose of the, of the statutory instrument. Of course, my lords, I accept it's against the general background of pressure on the prison uh, estate at the moment. But in the government's view, this is a measure that is fully justified in its own right, in fairness to offenders serving less than 12 months, and as a way of rebalancing the system in the way I have described. So, as your Lordships know, probation can recall offenders if their risk while on licence increases because they fail to keep in touch, not observe the curfew, been under the influence of alcohol if conditions uh, forbid uh, alcohol, etc. But as I've said, for those serving short sentences, the reality is that a, a one recall may mean that you're serving uh, the rest of your sentence, you're held in custody for too long, and then when you come out, of course, you're not on licence, your licence is finished, and it's much better in general for the short service, for the short sentence offenders to remain on licence when they're released back into the community for the balance of the sentence uh, period. So, my lords, the fixed term recall order will apply to lower level offenders who are aged 18 and over, serving custodial sentences of fewer than 12 months who are assessed as requiring uh, recall. It will not apply to the more serious offenders who are managed under what is known as the MAPA arrangements at, at levels two and three, or those that have been charged with a further serious offence under Schedule 18 of the Sentencing Act uh, 2020. As my right honourable and learned friend, the Lord Chancellor and the noble and learned Lord Stuart of Durleton updated the House the other day in their statements on foreign national offenders, prisons and probation, we're preparing the probation service to be ready for increased demand, uh, introducing changes to operating procedures that will allow frontline staff to maximize supervision of the most serious offenders and to deal with intervention and engagement at an, as early an effort uh, stage as possible. And I'd like to take the opportunity to express our deep gratitude to all those working in the criminal justice system, including prisons, probation, and police. They deserve enormous uh, credit for their commitment. They are under heavy pressure. They are managing magnificently. And I hope that this uh, statutory instrument will further uh, ease that burden and, as I say, rebalance the system in the way I hope I've described. So, my lords, I beg to move. I be agreed to. Well, um, I can sort of see the rationale for this. But I actually think it's completely misguided. Every time this government talks about tougher sentences, tough on the crime and causes of crime, it, it actually starts packing out the prisons. And of course, there's no capacity now. So this is a sort of a rather cynical move to actually clear out the prisons so that we can pack other people in. Now, I have got a much better idea, which I'll come to in a moment. But I don't understand why the government is wafting this statutory instrument through and yet finds it impossible to do something fairly fast for IPP prisoners. I, I really would like a, a, um, an explanation from the government. And of course, part of the problem is that we do tend to send people with low-level low drug abuses, crimes, to prison. Now, I'm going to suggest a very constructive way forward, which is that we give automatic release to anyone who is in prison for um, low-level drugs offences, uh, because actually they are less um, dangerous to other people and really only to themselves. And so, I, please, could we have some rationale about the prison system, which is crumbling with this government and could be um, better? Yeah, yeah. My Lord, apparently it's my turn. Yeah. <laughs> um, in a way, this is a continuation of the Lord Astley question. 
Uh, the Nobel uh, learned minister knows the crisis in our prison system, and that crisis is partly made from legislation that we've passed in this House over the last decades. Uh, because um, I remember when I went into government with, uh, when I still consider my noble friend Lord Clark, Clark Ken Clark, uh, we had some ideas of reducing uh, the prison population, which had then crept over 80,000, double what Ken Clark had experienced um, 20 years before, when he was Home Secretary in the early 1990s. And we sent a, a little package across to the, the, the number 10 Pollock Bureau, uh, and the message came back, not politically deliverable. And that has been the problem with governments of all shades over the last 20 years, of not being able or willing to try and bring down our prison population. Um, the noble lady is right in the movie. This is gesture politics, really, in what it will have. Uh, but it's a gesture in the right direction, and therefore we, we support it. Uh, there is a concern that it's another thing that's happened where uh, government, central government uh, move responsibility to local government and to local voluntary services um, who then themselves find themselves under pressure. And I would under ask if, if there will be any more help for um, the voluntary services if it does mean that more um, uh, uh, probationers uh, are in society and still needing su supervision. Uh, but going back to, to Lord Ashley's question, I, I do think one of the things that, uh, apart from the ridiculous idea of um, putting too many prison in, prisoners in prison that don't need to be there, and it can be better ma ma uh, uh, managed in uh, society, um, it would be to, to look at um, the whole process, uh, which is expensive and difficult and almost impossible in an overcrowded prison, of managing prisoners from a, a, a way out from at the end of the sentence, and perhaps using, as, we, as it came up in questions, and the minister indicated may already be happening, using some of the experience and wisdom of prison officers at the, towards the end of their career in, in that management and mentoring. But it, otherwise, we give this SI our support. My Lords, I'd like to apologise for arriving late um, for the Minister's uh, introduction of, the, uh, of this SI. Uh, we too support the SI uh, as far as it goes, but I have to say I agree with the noble lady, Lady Jones, in the first part of her speech where um, she pointed out quite rightly that on the one hand here we are reducing prison uh, sentences where there's other legislation in, uh, down the other end of the corridor which is of course increasing uh, prison sentences and of course we have the over overarching problem of a, of a prison service running at capacity and, um, and we, we're having or the government is having problems uh, building new, new prisons. So there is an overarching problem. Um, and that will be a problem for whichever parties in government. I, I need to acknowledge that point. But, my Lords, I think the central point is about the support for prisoners as they come out of prison. So we don't get this res uh, revolving door um, and that probation and, as the noble Lord, Lord McMally said, various um, uh, charitable and voluntary organisations uh, working with local authorities can properly support prisoners as they come out of prisons. As we know, and also, as we know, the most difficult cohort are these uh, prisoners who are on relatively short sentences, um, and that they are the the, high, the the most likely prisoners who are going to reoffend. And uh, as the noble lord knows, I, I am a sentencer myself. I do do uh, short sentences. It's part of our bread and butter, if you like, within the uh, magistrate system. And it is always with great regret that I will give uh, somebody, an offender, a, a, a short 
custodial sentence. But the reality is, is that we, we found ourselves in a position where we have no alternative because very often those offenders have been on multiple community sentences beforehand and so we as sentencers feel we have no choice. But of course the solution is support through the probation service and um, there has been some recruitment of probation officers although I understand there's a fairly high turnover and there's a problem with recruitment and there is a sort of reinvigoration of probation which of course I welcome as far as it goes. But really sh surely the long-term solution is a, is a renaissance for the probation service where they can really do their true vocation and many of them do feel a sense of vocation in their work so that they can try and get these most uh, this group of prisoners who are most likely to reoffend to properly engage them in the community so they don't reoffend. But as far as this specific SI goes, uh, we support it. Yeah, yeah. I'd just like to make a few comments. Um, I think the Renaissance should actually start somewhere else. I think the Renaissance should start, and I am in a certain, a certain uh, experience on this, the Renaissance should be starting that all the naughty boys who later on become the naughtier boys and the naughtier men should be addressed and supported. And Lord Bellamy and I have talked about this. That what we're doing largely with our young now, though there are some wonderful um, um, projects and initiatives, is we are warehousing them. And when I was a young person who was in the custodial system, if I wanted to climb Mount Everest, uh, and as long as I didn't rob an old lady on the way, they were very happy to help me. They were help, happy to help me do O-levels or other kind of things. And I think until we stop always responding to the problem as it is, there is always a need to respond to an emergency. But if you don't back it up with prevention, with stopping our children, largely from the same class that I come from, people who fail at school. When I, go into, um, when I go into Pentonville, the first thing I ask is how many people did well at school? And a couple of people put up their hands. So actually the, the rot starts very early on. They are inheritors of poverty. So until we have a thinking, we can't deal with the emergency just by keep dealing with the emergency. We have to actually grow up and start creating a system that first of all helps the children who come through the system and then at the same time actually look at the social engineering which is necessary to stop producing children who fail at school and their only inheritance is poverty. My Lords, may I first, uh, if I may, compliment Lord Bird on that last intervention, uh, which seemed to me personally uh, to be full of common sense. We know what a very large number of uh, people, we know that a very large number of people in the prison estate, particularly in the male estate, are dyslexic. That almost tells you all you need to know about why they're in prison, because they've fallen through, fallen through the various, the various uh, protections. So um, it's somewhat outside the scope of today's debate, but it, if I may say so, a point well made that all governments should be thinking about profoundly as to how we tackle this problem as so, so often, as early as we can through a different way of approaching the social problems that, that lead to the situation that, that we're in. So I, I thank the noble Lord, Lord Bird for that, for those, for those comments. I would like to thank, too, if I may, the, the, the Lady Baroness Jones for her, for her comments. Um, I would hope that this is not a cynical move. I entirely see the potential um, contradiction in some ways uh, that uh, we are involved in. I think the government's general policy has been to, and probably most governments' general policy, has tried to be tougher on the more serious offences, but think harder about how you tackle the less serious offences and today we're talking about the less serious offences. We will come to IPP prisoners, I think, in the report stage of the Victors and Prisoners Bill. We discussed it the other night. And automatic release for low-level drug offenders, a very, 
um, a very creative idea, some way away, I think, from the thinking of the present government, but another thing to put on our list of things to think about, if I may say so, to the noble lady in thanking her for her intervention. And if I may, I'd also like to thank the noble Lord uh, McNally, who, with great distinction, discharged the office that I now hold. So I regard myself as sort of grandson, in a way, of the noble lord. And his, his approach at the time with the noble lord Clark, uh, my noble friend Lord Clark of Nottingham, was a very sensible approach, no doubt, in that time. But as all governments know, you have to deal both with the you have to deal with the political framework that one finds oneself in. And the present government, in putting forward this, this order, is, is, I hope, producing a practical solution to a very pressing problem. And, of course, I would finally agree with the noble Lord um, Punsonby that support for the probation service, perhaps even a renaissance for the probation service, is something devoutly to be wished. Uh, we have to do what we can as we can with the resources that we have. But the, the overall goal is, I think, uh, is I think one that most members of this House would, would share. So I think, my lords, unless there's any other point I haven't dealt with, I beg to move. The question is that this motion be agreed to. As many as are of that opinion will say content. Yes. The contrary, not content. The contents have it. Message from the Commons that they have passed the Supply and Appropriation Anticipation and Adjustments Bill to which they desire the agreement of your Lordships. My Lords, Supply and Appropriation Anticipation and Adjustments Bill. I beg to move that this bill be now read a first time. The question is that this bill now be read a first time. As many are as of that opinion will say content. The contrary, not content. The contents have it. Motion for debate. The spring budget to be debated with the second reading of the National Insurance Contribution Reductions in Rates No. 2 Bill, Baroness Veer of Norberton. My Lords, it is a pleasure to open this double header in your Lordship's House this afternoon. It's an opportunity to discuss and debate the measures brought forth by the Chancellor in the spring budget and to consider the National Insurance Contributions Reduction in Rates No. 2 Bill, or the NICS Bill. I would like to start by taking the opportunity to welcome my noble friend Lord Kempsell to your Lordship's house. He brings much experience and expertise, and I very much look forward to hearing his maiden speech today. But before I delve into the measures announced in the spring budget, I shall first touch on the wider economic context. In recent times, the UK economy has felt imp the impacts of a financial crisis, a pandemic and an energy shock caused by the war in Europe. And yet, despite the most challenging economic headwinds in modern history, since 2010, growth in the UK has been higher than every other large European economy. Unemployment has halved, absolute poverty has gone down, and there are 800 more people in jobs for every single day that this government has been in office. The Government remains steadfast in its support for the Independent Monetary Policy Committee at the Bank of England in its action to bring inflation down. Supported by the MPC's actions and the Government's fiscal policy, inflation has fallen significantly from its peak and is forecast to return to the 2% target in the coming months. And because of the progress we have made, because we are delivering the Prime Minister's economic priorities, we can now help families not only with temporary cost of living support, but also with permanent cuts in taxation. We do this because lower tax means higher growth. Higher growth means more opportunity, more prosperity and more funding for public services. With the pandemic behind us, we must once again build up our resilience to shoot to future shocks. That means bringing down borrowing so we can start to reduce our debt. The OBR has confirmed that, based on the measures announced at the spring budget, debt will fall in every year of the forecast to 94.3% of GDP by 28-29. Underlying debt, which excludes Bank of England debt, will be at 91.7% of GDP in 24-25, according to the OBR, 
rising slightly before falling to 92.9% in 28-29. The Government will have final year headroom of £8.9 billion against the fiscal rule to have debt falling in the fifth year of the forecast. Our underlying debt is therefore on track to fall as a share of GDP, meeting our fiscal rule. We also meet our second fiscal rule for public sector borrowing to be below 3% of GDP three years early. My Lords, this is a budget for long-term growth. The ONS reported last week that GDP rose by 0.2% in January, and the OBR expects the economy to grow by 0.8% this year and 1.9% next year. My Lords, we have well and truly turned a corner. Since 2010, we have grown faster than Germany, France or Italy, the three largest European economies. And according to the IMF, we will grow faster than all three of them cumulatively in the next five years. And that means we must stick to our plan of more investment, more jobs, better public services and lower taxes. Malouz, I would like to turn first to investment. At the autumn statement, the Chancellor announced that the Government would introduce permanent full expensing, a £10 billion tax cut for businesses that gives the UK the most attractive investment tax regime of any large European or G7 country. At spring budget, we went further, announcing that the Government will soon publish draft legislation for full expensing to apply to leased assets, a change we will bring in as soon as it is affordable. And, my Lords, this Government is on the side of small businesses, the backbone of our economy. As well as the business rate support and work on prompt payments announced in autumn, the Government will provide £200 million of funding to extend the recovery loan scheme as it transitions to the Growth Guarantee Scheme, helping 11,000 SMEs to access the finance they need. The Government will also reduce the administrative and financial impact of VAT by increasing the VAT threshold from £85,000 to £90,000 from the 1st of April. This is the first increase in seven years. This will bring tens of thousands of businesses out of paying VAT altogether and encourage many more to invest and grow. Turning now to the Chancellor's growth industries, these sectors remain a key focus of the spring budget. For clean energy, we will allocate up to £120 million more to the Green Industries Growth Accelerator to build supply chains for new technology. For advanced manufacturing, we have announced over £270 million of joint government and industry investment into innovative new automotive and aerospace R&D projects. For artificial intelligence, we will invest up to £100 million over the next five years in the Turing Institute, our national institute for AI and data science. We recognise that the benefits of tomorrow's technology rely on investing today. For life sciences, we will support research by medical charities with an additional £45 million. This will go into a wide range of diseases, including dementia, cancer and epilepsy. And, because of the Government's support in this sector, AstraZeneca has announced plans to invest £650 million in the UK. And finally, for creative industries, we are making permanent the 45% and 40% rates of theatre, orchestra and museums and galleries tax relief, and we'll be introducing a tax credit for UK independent films. My Lords, turning to public services, in 2010, schools in the UK were behind Germany, France and Sweden in the OECD's PISA Education Rankies, Rankings for Reading and Maths. Now we're ahead of them. Burglaries and violent crime have halved over the last 14 years and we have invested in 20,000 more police officers. Our armed forces remain the most professional and best funded in Europe, with defence spending already more than 2% of GDP. My Lord, overall spending in public services has gone up since 2010 and, in the case of the NHS, has gone up by over a third in real terms. However, the best way to improve public services is not always more money or more people. We also need to run them more efficiently. 
and that is why the Chancellor has announced a landmark public sector productivity plan that restarts public service reform and changes the Treasury's traditional approach to public spending. Ahead of the pandemic, between 2010 and 2019, productivity in the public sector was increasing by just under 1% a year. However, today, public sector productivity is estimated to be 5.9% below pre-pandemic levels. If we can return to pre-pandemic levels of productivity, the OBR states this could save the equivalent of £20 billion. My Lords, this Government can deliver these efficiency savings. The cornerstone of our public sector product productivity programme is comprehensive investment in the NHS to tra transform its technology, <coughs> upgrading it for the years ahead. That is why the Government is providing £6 billion of additional funding to the NHS, including funding to cover its productivity plan in full. My Lords, when it comes to taxes, the Government has consistently maintained that those with the broadest shoulders should contribute a little more. And that is why the Government will abolish the current complicated tax system for non-DOMs, getting rid of the outdated concept of domicile and the remittance basis in the tax system and replacing it with a modern, simpler and fairer residence-based system. From April 2025, individuals who opt into the new residence regime will not pay UK tax on foreign income and gains for their first four years of UK tax residence. This is a simpler, more modern regime and is highly competitive with other similar residence regimes in Europe. But after four years, those who continue to live in the UK will pay the same tax as other UK residents. To ensure these changes are introduced in a careful and responsible way, we will put in place transitional arrangements for individuals who are affected by these changes. This will include a two-year temporary repatriation facility from April 2025, where individuals can bring in their foreign income and gains that accrued while they were taxed on the remittance basis to the UK at a 12% tax rate so that it can be invested here. <coughs> This transitional arrangement will attract an additional £15 billion of foreign funds to the UK and generate more than £1 billion of extra tax. Overall, abolishing non-DOM status will raise £2.7 billion a year by the end of the forecast period. Touching further on tax measures, to discourage non-smokers from taping, taking up vaping, we will introduce an excise duty on vaping products from the tw October 2026. To maintain the financial incentive to choose vaping over smoking, we will also make an additional one-off increase in tobacco duty alongside the introduction of the vaping products duty. We are also making a one-off adjustment to rates of air passenger duty on non-economy flights only to account for high inflation in recent years. And perhaps most importantly, we are providing HMRC with the resources they need to ensure that everyone pays the tax they owe. This will lead to an increase in revenue collected of over £4.5 billion across the forecast period. And, my Lords, the Government will use this increased revenue to help cut taxes on working families, including those who rely on child benefit. Child benefit helps with the additional costs associated with having children. And when it works, it's good for children, it's good for parents, and it's good for the economy. However, the current system is confusing and unfair. <coughs> that is why the Chancellor has announced a consultation on moving the high-income child benefit charge to a household-based system to be introduced in April 2026. In the meantime, the Government will introduce two changes to make the current system fairer. Firstly, from this April, the high income child benefit charge threshold will be raised from £50,000 to £60,000. And secondly, we will raise the top of the taper at which it was, is withdrawn to £80,000. This means no one earning under £60,000 will pay the charge, taking 170,000 families out of paying it altogether. According to the OBR, this change will see an increase in hours among those already working, equivalent to around 10,000 more people entering the workforce. 
This is not the only support the government is providing to families. At the budget, the, count, the, the Chancellor announced a six-month extension to the Household Support Fund, meaning vulnerable households will benefit from its support up until September 2024. In addition, alcohol duty will remain frozen until February 2025. The Chancellor will also maintain the 5% cut in fuel duty and freeze it for a further 12 months, saving the average car driver £50 next year and bringing the total savings since the 5p cut was introduced to around £250. My Lords, because of the progress we have made in bringing down inflation, because of the additional investment that is now flowing into the economy, because we have a plan for better and more efficient public services, and because we have asked those with the broadest shoulders to pay a bit more, this Government is once again able to reduce taxes. From April the 6th, the main rate of employee national insurance will be cut by another 2p, from 10% to 8%, and the main rate of self-employed national insurance will be cut from 8% to 6%. Which brings me to the next bill before your Lordship's House today. It has two measures. First, the reduction of the main rate of employee Class 1 NICS announced by the Chancellor at Spring Budget, and this cut builds on the changes to NICS made at the Autumn Statement, and we will once again support working people by reducing the main rate of employee class 1 NICS by two percentage points to 8% on earnings between £12,570 and £50,270 from the 6th of April 2024. This will cut taxes for over 27 million employees. Secondly, the NICS bill contains a further reduction to the main rate of class 4 NICS for the self-employed. The Chancellor announced at the Autumn Statement that the main rate of Class 4 would re be reduced from 9% to 8% from the 6th of April. With the introduction of this bill, we are cutting the Class 4 main rate further by two percentage points, from 8% to 6% from April 2024. As a result of the cuts to Class 4 NICs at Spring Budget, an average self-employed person on £28,000 will see a total savings of £310 in 2024-25. Combined with the cuts from the Autumn Statement, including abolishing the requirement to pay Class 2 NICs, this will save an average self-employed person £650 a year. Together with the Autumn Statement's cuts, this is an overall tax cut worth over £20 billion per year. It's the largest ever cut to employee and self-employed national insurance. My Lords, the Government is committed to tax cuts that reward and incentivise work and which will grow the economy in a sustainable way whilst ensuring that inflation remains under control. And these measures will not only benefit those already in work. According to the OBR, the next cuts announced at Spring Budget will increase total hours worked by the equivalent of almost 100,000 full-time workers by 28-29. But, my Lords, this Government is not just supporting working people. This April, pensioners will benefit from an 8.5% increase in the state pension, which is on top of the 10.1% increase from last year. The full yearly amount of the basic state pension is £3,700 higher in cash terms than it was in 2010. I'm sure that all noble Lords across the House will welcome these measures. My Lords, I have outlined only some of the measures announced by the Chancellor in his Spring Budget and have touched briefly on the details of the next Bill, but there is certainly much more to cover. At the debate on the Autumn Statement, I listened very carefully to many Noble Lords as they encouraged the Government to spend more or to make other costly changes. I noted in my closing remarks that few set out how they would plan to pay for their proposed changes. My Lords, this spring budget is carefully balanced to focus on growth, and it's prudent given the economic headwinds that we have focused, which, have, uh, which, which we have faced, which have impacted our growth and our level of debt. But my Lords, we have now turned a corner. As the noble Lord, Lord Macpherson said this weekend, it's very easy to get depressed about the British economy, but the plain fact is that it generally grows. There is more money in people's 
pockets. The worst of the energy crisis is behind us. If anything, I would expect the economy to outperform expectations for the rest of the year. My Lords, I would too. I beg to move. The question is that this motion be agreed to. Um, my Lords, debating the budget statement carries a great temptation to focus on the short term, on immediate tax and spend decisions. But today, we can avoid misleading, often misleading, short term analysis and make an informed assessment of Conservative economic policy relying on the fairly accurate data of the past 14 years. No forecasting is necessary, the facts will do. And the crucial fact with respect to the growth performance of the economy is growth per capita, not the number used by the noble lady. The number used by the noble lady is, as we know, growth driven by the highest level of immigration into this country in modern times. So, growth per capita. Since 2008, that is prior to the global financial crisis, UK income per capita has grown at less than one-fifth of one percent per year, one of the worst long-term performances since the war, and one of the worst in the G7. Consequently, average real household disposable income after taxes and benefits is lower today than it was 16 years ago. And that is the worst economic performance since the war. So today, after year after year of Tory-led economic failure, we have a no-growth, high-tax, high-debt economy, a crumbling public realm, education underfunded, and an NHS in near collapse. Of course, there were worldwide economic shocks to navigate, the global financial crisis, the pandemic, the war in Ukraine. But much of Britain's economic misery was self-inflicted. Consider the following. In the first half of 2010, the UK economy was on the road to recovery from the impact of the financial crisis. In the months before the May election, the economy was growing at a rate approaching 3% per annum. Conservative austerity killed that growth stone dead. The five years of austerity resulted in higher unemployment and lower investment, both public and private. The UK didn't recover pre-2008 levels of income until 2015. Germany recovered it four years earlier. Austerity defined an assault on the public sector. For a decade, real spending per capita on health actually fell, and it still barely recovered. Real education spending per pupil fell by 8%. The police force, the justice system, and defense have been criminally underfunded. And then there's the attack on local government. 14 years of swimming pools closed, libraries closed, youth services cut, local skills initiatives cut, the Conservative Party has hollowed out the facilities and institutions that define communities. For so many, they have destroyed hope. Then came Brexit. In the economic and fiscal outlook, the OBR has taken the opportunity of newly available data to confirm their view that the impact of Brexit is a permanent 4% reduction in GDP. That translates into lost government revenue just this year of £42 billion. In an attempt to manage the disruption of Brexit, the Conservatives launched an industrial strategy in 2017, complete with glossy brochures setting out 180 diverse policy measures and commitments. In 2019, they created an independent industrial strategy council, chaired by Andy Haldane, to offer evaluation and advice. Unfortunately, Haldane's rather chilly evaluation was too much for the government. In 2021, the Secretary of State for Business and Industrial Strategy told the other place that he was abolishing the Industrial Strategy Council, arguing, and I quote, I have read the Industrial Strategy comprehensively, and it was a pudding without a theme. I am very pleased to announce to the House we are morphing 
and changing the industrial strategy into the plan for growth. Thus spake Quasi Corting. A year later, his plan for growth inflicted devastating damage on the British economy. Now we have Jeremy Hunt's plan, echoed by the noble lady. The foundation stone is set out in the budget speech, and I quote, Conservatives look around the world at economies in North America and Asia and notice that countries with lower taxes generally have higher growth, unquote. Unfortunately, years of academic and policy research have demonstrated quite conclusively that this proposition is simply false. For example, a week after the budget, the Free Market Institute of Economic Affairs, the Institute of Economic Affairs, close supporters of the Conservative Party, commented, and I quote, tax cuts do not generate sustainable higher rates of economic growth. When we compare growth rates averaged over long time frames between different countries, there is little correlation, negative or positive, with tax burdens or more marginal tax. So speaks the Institute of Economic Affairs. Yet Jeremy Hunt clings on to the trust quarting light, even citing the Laffer curve in his budget speech, a reference that eliminates any suggestion that his thinking is serious. To sum up, commentators across the political spectrum agree that the next government will inherit from today's Conservatives a uniquely dire economic situation. If the new government should be Labour, it is argued that the economic fundamentals are so bad that Labour will be forced to abandon all its economic and social goals. Fortunately, that prediction is incorrect. Economic history tells us that beginning from the worst can lead to the best. Four policy ingredients are required. A government with a comprehensive commitment to long-term investment. A vision of the commercial demands of the future and the technologies to meet them. A private sector corporate structure geared to long-term investment. And a financial system that funnels resources to long-term investors. A better characterization of Keir Starmer's missions for Britain would be difficult to find. A commitment to the rebuilding of material and human capital, a focus on the inevitable demands for new green technologies as the world faces up to the costs of climate change, legal reforms to stimulate the private sector, and a new national wealth fund to channel investment that fulfills long-term goals. But let's just go back in conclusion to this scorched earth budget. The past 14 years suggest that the Conservative Party should join Economics Anonymous. The party should admit its horrible errors, identify their origin in defective ideology, and rethink its way back to economic sanity. A decade or so in quiet opposition is required. <coughs> My Lords, I declare my interests as in the register. The economy is in the doldrums, which gave the Chancellor little room for manoeuvre. And I want to address two mendable reasons for the doldrums. One issue, it will come as no surprise, is the double counting cost disclosure that's killing the investment trust sector. The Mail's This Is Money led yesterday on over 130 investment company directors representing some 120 billion of assets writing to the Chancellor about the urgency of changing EU rules that the UK is applying in a draconian gold-plating form. I know that it's gold-plating, not law, because 10 years ago, whilst Chair of the European Parliament's Econ Committee, I suggested exempting investment <coughs> trusts from the PRIPS definition, and I was told by EU officials I could not exempt what was not covered. And in Ireland, they obtained legal opinions that investment trusts weren't covered. Then interaction with MIFID requirements, also gold-plated, has created the disaster of a shutdown in fundraising and daily news of investors leaving the sector. Every day, long-only managers suffering redemptions and net outflows of funds from portfolios which hold investment trusts. 
Every day, weak share prices with deep discounts to NAV across all categories. Every day, scarce bids in the market and those that there are mainly arbitrageurs with shorter time horizons than the usual long-term investors like wealth managers, pension, charity and multi-manager, multi-asset funds. Every day, British assets snapped up cheaply by overseas purchasers. Every day, independent financial advisors, local authority pensions and charity funds scrubbing investment trusts from their advice or portfolios because it's too complicated to explain the high costs aren't true. Some £7 billion plus a year of critical funding into UK infrastructure wiped out, with projects being starved, sold and bust, and jobs and businesses closing in the real economy. Now, I'm sure the Chancellor would have liked to announce £7 billion a year investment that didn't cost the taxpayer anything. Instead, it's being killed. I know the Minister will say government is working at pace to replace EU legislation, but I really don't understand why UK-specific gold plating is not just taken away for an instant solution. This has been going on at critical levels now for two years, and damage may be irreversible, with habits changed. How will the government redress that? And it poses the question of what on earth can ever be done truly at pace when there is an emergency. Something is badly wrong, and it is not just because it's retained EU law, when actually it's only retained FCA interpretation. Of course there are other headwinds on trusts, but this is the big one and the correctable one. The second topic is that that was raised in William Hague and Tony Blair's joint report and concerns initial procurement from young UK businesses and the need to have a buyer of first resort. One of the reasons tech companies go to the US to list, to the detriment of our wider economy, is because they go there to obtain sufficient core procurement to establish themselves. Success is not all about investment or loans. They are more plentiful here than procurement. Lack of UK procurement is endemic across private and public sectors for both young innovative companies and for those big enough to be in the public eye. One example is Graphcore. Given the UK's desire to be a leading AI nation for AI, why are they missing out on opportunities in favour of more established overseas companies? Can the Minister actually name any domestic procurement success stories? For newer, smaller technology firms, they first have to seek grants, often offering below minimum wage daily rates once the cost of applying is factored in. Then, Innovation procurement in the public sector isn't really, available, avail isn't really available. Instead, they are offered open competitions for cross-support over such as commercialisation grants, which use up time and resources but don't end up in procurement. Underpinning this malaise is that it's far easier for a department to procure a large consultant than it is for them to procure a young technology business. Barriers include fear or lack of willingness to trial a new technology, concern about becoming stuck with a new technology provider, and fear that the technology not working will be seen as failure. The fact that they already end up stuck with the usual suspects, plus failure, via the usual consultants, seems not to feature. The syndrome of can't be blamed for choosing them seems to dominate. Whether the procurer <laughs> is government by a tier one contractors or management consultants or the private sector. <coughs> the economy needs procurement from the ground up, 
the vital first million contract win, then growing with such a business if it is showing good product or service quality. This is the route to a broader, more competitive supplier market and a wider knowledge universe. And over time, reducing reliance on a procurement process that always gets dominated by incumbents and foreign competitors. It will eventually lead to homegrown talent staying at home and listing at home. My Lords, I worked on seven pre-election budgets over my life sentence at the Treasury, and I feel for any Chancellor having to deliver one. He has to reconcile the usually unrealistic demands of his supporters with the the need to retain integrity by doing the right thing. And there is much in the budget and in this bill to approve of. First, on the economy, where prospects seem a little brighter. Inflation is falling, real wages are finally rising, and unemployment remains low. Secondly, there are some sensible tax-raising measures. As the Chancellor confirmed in his budget speech, reforming the rules on residence and domicile has been under discussion for 40 years or more. I welcome the Chancellor finally grasping the nettle. Whether it will raise quite as much money as the OBR estimates, I rather doubt. Seriously rich citizens of the world are notoriously footloose, but it is right in principle. And if you're going to cut taxes, and I recognise that's a big if, prioritising national insurance reductions over income tax is an act of a courageous Chancellor. In the old days, rentiers and capitalists tended to face higher tax rates than workers, who received earned income relief. That was turned on its head in the 1980s, and since then, successive chancellors have tended to raise national insurance rates effectively to pay for income tax reductions. Occasionally, they felt a little guilty. Both Lord Lawson and Gordon Brown reformed national insurance at some considerable cost, but the trend was clear. The basic rate of income tax has fallen from 35% in the mid-70s to 20% today. Meanwhile, the effective rate of employee national insurance contributions rose from 5.5% in the mid-70s to peak at 13.25% in 2021. This benefited the old at the expense of the young. It privileged investment and rental income over wages and salaries. I recall that whenever I tried to get a Chancellor interested in cutting national insurance, and I recall working on a package to help the low-paid with my right honourable friend Lord Lamont, um, I would get a pitying look. I was told it wouldn't work politically. Voters didn't like paying income tax while they thought national insurance was paying for their pension or the NHS, and so objected to it much less. The Chancellor has turned this on its head. He is raising income tax while cutting national insurance. It is the right thing to do. It focuses relief on those who need it and should improve labour supply. Though I do worry about the number of people in modestly paid jobs, police sergeants and senior nurses come to mind, who are being dragged into higher rate tax. But though prioritising national insurance is the right thing to do, I do worry about its affordability. I welcome the Chancellor's ambitions on public service productivity, but having seen many an efficiency review come and go, I would be surprised if this one moves the dial sufficiently to offset rising pressures on public spending. These have been set out at length by the OBR in their excellent Fiscal Risks and Sustainability Report, further proof, if any were needed, that George Osborne was right to strengthen the institutional framework supporting sensible macroeconomic policy. The fact is that the demographic pressures which the likes of the noble Lord Lord Fowler worried about in the 1980s have already materialised and will only get worse in the years ahead. The triple lock has made things worse and the increasing cost of social care, sorry, add in the increasing cost of social care and we have a real problem. And then there is the national security situation which has deteriorated considerably over the last two years. And so, although generally approving of Mr Hunt's time as Chancellor, 
and we should all thank him for preventing the British economy falling into the abyss in October, 19, in October 2022. I was disappointed by the budget's silence on defence spending. I don't know whether we will end up having spent half a percent or one percent more of national income on defence. Either way, we are talking of at least £15 billion more of spending pressures. Add to that the pressures on health, social care and pensions, and we are looking at tens of billions more. And so at some point in the coming decade, whichever party is in power, the government is going to have to look again at a health and social care levy. As and when it is introduced, I recommend that the government uses the income tax base rather than the national insurance base. It is right that all citizens with the necessary income pay it rather than just those who are working. Finally, I'd like to say a few words on the Chancellor's plan for a retail offer of NatWest shares. As the accounting officer at the Treasury when RBS was taken into public ownership, I've always taken an interest in trying to get as much money back for the taxpayer as possible. The RBS share price was trading in line with the price we paid for it, around £5 in current prices, when the late Alistair Darling left office in 2010. Since then, the price has languished, la languished, partly because of wider banking reforms, partly because of low interest rates, and partly because of problems specific to RBS NatWest. I support the principle of selling NatWest. It needs the state off its back. And hitherto, the government has secured a competitive price for it through its trading plan in the wholesale market. I fear that a successful retail offer will require a heavy discount, which means that the taxpayer will be subsidising retail investors. The case for subsidising share ownership is much weaker than it was in the 1980s. Shareholding is more widespread. And history suggests that banks are perhaps not the best entry point to shareholding. I know the Chancellor has said that any sale will be subject to value for money, but VFM is in the eye of the beholder. Can the Minister commit to publishing the Accounting Officer's advice on VFM as and when the sale goes ahead? My, my Lords, as uh, the noble Lord Macpherson has said, the Chancellor faced a very difficult set of conflicting challenges. Having myself delivered one budget on the very eve of a general election, I particularly appreciate the almost intolerable pressure that was on the Chancellor, although I think he delivered a budget that was both responsible and constructive. My Lords, in the recent past, we've been fed an unremitting diet of gloom, which has caused a certain outbreak of schadenfreude in some quarters. But this budget, I believe, does contain some modest rays of hope. There are definite grounds, as the Minister said, for believing that we are turning a corner. Fifteen months ago, the Bank of England was forecasting the economy this year would contract by, last year, would contract by 1.4 per cent. The OBR was saying much the same. If we had been told then that both of them are going to be proved wrong, that growth would pick up this year, that inflation would be expected shortly to reach its 2 per cent target, and that the government deficit and debt were now expected to edge down over a five-year horizon. If people had been told that 15 months ago, I think they would have been both sceptical and rather pleased. Growth may be modest, as has been emphasised already, but so it is everywhere in Europe. Now, the UK is forecast, as the Minister said, by the IMF, to have faster growth than any major European economy over the next five years. And GDP per capita, which Lord Eatwell uh, chose to concentrate on, GDP per capita is forecast to increase between 1% and 1.5% a year, way above the figures he was quoting. That is better than the economy has achieved over the last five or the last ten years. Even Bloomberg, hardly an enthusiast for post-Brexit UK, declared Britain isn't a basket case after all, and its chief economist actually announced that Britain might surpass the official forecast this year. The centrepiece in the budget was the reduction in national insurance contributions. It was a bold decision, of course, 
to cut a tax not paid by the retired, but I think it was the right one because of the overriding need to incentivise work. History, as we all know, consists of a series of exceptional events. But when contemplating our present discontents, people are inclined just to dismiss or forget as excuses the extreme exceptional events of the last five years, which have been referred to in this debate. COVID resulted in a drop in GDP of some 10% and consequent expenditure of £500 billion supporting the incomes of people through the crisis. After the energy price hike, it was always inevitable that living standards would fall for a period. If I have a criticism of the government, the criticism would be that they didn't make that clearer at the very beginning. Our situation is not different from other countries. Living standards have fallen in Germany and in Italy in the last few years. Some critics complained that the Chancellor in his statement wasn't bolder and should have announced larger tax cuts. Anyone who advocates such a course needs to explain how they would deal with what the IFS has called the most challenging fiscal situation for 80 years, with our debt just below 100% of GDP and debt interest not so long ago reached a figure of £100 billion a year. Tax cuts do not automatically pay for themselves, although I don't entirely agree with Lord Equal about the Laffer curve. My Lords, if you spend £500 billion, 50% of one year's tax revenues on COVID measures supporting people's living standards, it's almost inevitable that the tax burden will increase somewhat. Our tax burden after this involuntary, forced increase is still below major European countries. Of course it is still too high, but it's not a decision the government made easily or willingly or with great enthusiasm. And it doesn't mean that living standards can't in time, as we're seeing, begin to recover. Wages have risen in the last few years by 10%. The national insurance reductions have cut in half the effects of freezing tax thresholds up to this point. We've been through a tsunami, but we've weathered the storm, and hopefully, with geopolitics permitting, calmer waters might lie ahead. Sustained growth doesn't come from turbocharging demand. Turbocharging, experience teaches us, usually ends badly. Sustained growth has got to come from the supply side, from being more competitive, including competitive taxes, of course, innovation and an adequate labour supply. On that point, a major challenge for the economy is the degree of in in economic inactivity. 9.3 million people of working age are currently economically inactive. The tax measures in the budget and other measures do increase the labour supply over the survey period by the equivalent of nearly 200,000 full-time employees. But these figures, impressive though they are, are dwarfed by the increase in incapacity benefit claimants from 2.5 million in 1920 to 3.1 million in 2022-23. Two-thirds of claims for incapacity benefits now involve mental and behavioural disorders. I don't want to cause any offence, but I think the Prime Minister was quite right recently to ask the question, is the country really three times sicker than it was a decade ago? I'd like to ask the Minister what action the Government take to tackle this crucial issue. I read in the newspapers that the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions is examining the capability assessments and thinks that over time this might release several hundred thousand people onto the labour market. I'd be grateful if she could give us some details of this. A very significant further measure in the budget was the productivity plan for the NHS. It is appalling that the UK public sector is less efficient than it was in 1997. The Chancellor believes that by investing £3.4 billion, the plan could unlock £35 billion worth of savings in the NHS, ten times the original sum. This, in theory, makes a lot of sense. Pouring an increasing amount of money into a broken system 
is pointless, as Wes Treating has said. I know that this is not a PR stunt, but a serious initiative in which the Cabinet Office Minister has been working for some time. But can I again ask the Minister, can we be sure, absolutely sure, that the Government really can deliver these productivity gains on the stated timeline? The Government's record in productivity enhancing IT systems is poor. If the productivity gains fail to materialise, then the Government's spending projections, already very tight, will become unrealisable and unaffordable. So it is vital these targets are met. My Lords, I welcome this budget. It achieves the right balance in a difficult situation, and it gives a modest boost to the economy, and I commend it to this House. My Lords, uh, weary disappointment is the message I get from responses to the budget from anti-poverty, children's and women's organisations. Weary because here is yet another budget that fails to put the interests of those for whom they speak first. Disappointment because as the cost of living payments come to an end, but living costs are still a life-sapping struggle for those on low incomes, witness the unprecedented, unprecedented numbers turning to food banks, um, and the evidence of tired and hungry children in schools, they had hoped for more. Yes, there are some welcome crumbs, including the abolition of the debt relief order charge and the extension of the universal credit budgeting advanced loans repayment period, although the latter only touches the surface of UC's deeper problems. Welcome too is the last minute reprieve for the Household Support Fund, but giving local authorities only 26 days notice and then creating a new cliff edge in September is not an effective or efficient way to plan local crisis support. It is particularly alarming for those living in the 37 English authorities who no longer run a discretionary local welfare assistance scheme that replaced the National Social Fund. Rather than lurch from cliff edge to cliff edge, would it not make sense to integrate the temporary fund of local welfare assistance creating a single statutory scheme centrally funded on a multi-year and ring-fence basis with clear guidance but still providing local authorities with some discretion as to how the money should be spent. I'd be grateful if the noble lady of the minister could take that suggestion back to the relevant departments. With regards to children, the additional money announced for the next two years for childcare and Commons ministers seem to have forgotten that it was the last Labour government that first recognised government responsibility for childcare. This will certainly help, but will not fill the gap between what providers receive per hour and the real cost of delivering those hours, according to the Women's Budget Group, of which I'm a member wearing my academic hat. My Lords, I do welcome the rise in the child benefit high income charge threshold and smoother taper. However, while I certainly recognise the unfairness created by the present system, I don't believe the answer is to jettison the important principle of independent taxation, which, after all, was pioneered by a Conservative government back in 1990 and was endorsed by the Minister the other week. Moreover, as tax experts have warned and the Chancellor conceded, it will require significant reform to the tax system. Such reforms are likely to pose considerable administrative problems and, if introduced on a cost-neutral basis, would create as many losers as gainers, according to the IFS. Might I therefore ask that the consultation on this includes the op option of abolishing the charge altogether? After all, to quote the Chancellor and, uh, in part, the, the noble lady, the Minister, Child benefit is a lifeline for many parents because it helps with additional costs associated with having children. When it works, it is good for children, good for parents, and good for the economy because it helps people into work. And in the words of Sebastian Payne of Onward, there would be no greater sign than Hunt and Sunak are on the side of families. Reversion to universal child benefit, supported by the Conservative Party in the past, would also do more for the simplification the Chancellor seeks, according to his letter to peers. Of course, the traditional rabbit in the hat, which jumped out prematurely this year, was the cut in nicks. True to form, this particular rabbit favoured the better off over the worst off and men over women. And it's difficult to see how this could have been a priority 
over investment in our crumbling public services, social care, housing, and a social security system which fails to provide genuine security. As it is, according to the Resolution Foundation, the scale of cuts to unprotected departments is equivalent to almost three quarters of the size of those inflicted in the first austerity parliament. This will mean more cuts for local authorities. And I speak as a citizen of Nottingham that faces the heartbreaking des destruction of vital public and voluntary services, jobs, parks, the arts and libraries, hitting women in particular as workers, service users and unpaid, unpaid care providers. My Lords, the Chancellor has made clear his longer-term ambition to scrap NICs altogether. We now learn that the Prime Minister hopes to fund this through a further squeeze on Social Security benefits mentioned by the, the noble Lord, Lord Lamont. Again, repeating the way in which Social Security claimants were demonised and benefit cuts paid for tax cuts during the height of austerity, leaving a Social Security system not worthy of the name. Moreover, in, scrapping, in, in framing the scrapping of NICs as a simplifying tax cut, the government appeared to be indifferent to the implications not just of pensions, but also working age contributory benefits. It took the Daily Telegraph to observe it would completely remove even a semblance of the contributory principle. As a letter to the eye warned, this could represent a nudge towards private insurance, the only alternative being means-tested UC, with potential damaging implications again for women in couples, independent social security entitlement. Could the minister please clarify what the government thinks this will mean for contributory benefits for working age people as well as pensioners? In, in conclusion, my lords, whether the budget represents this, in Tim Bale's words, fag end government's final or penultimate fiscal event, it underlines the need for a strategy that prioritises social justice in the interest of people in poverty, especially children, together with women and other marginalised groups. Yeah. Well uh, my Lords, let me begin by welcoming two announcements in the budget, one touched on by the noble Baroness uh, Lady Lister. Uh, last month, along with other noble Lords, I called for an extension of the Household uh, Support Fund, uh, which was otherwise due to expire at the end of this month. Uh, basically, this is money from the DWP to local authorities to help households struggling with food, energy costs, and $2.5 billion has been invested in this scheme uh, since October uh, 22. And actually, it's the largest investment in the capacity of local authorities to deliver crisis support following the abolition of the social fund. And local authorities whose budgets are under pressure would not have been able to find the £900 million pounds uh, to carry on with the scheme. So, uh, top marks to the Chancellor for listening to those requests and for extending it. <clears throat> However, it is now due to expire at the end of September, uh, just before a general election and during the Labour Party conference. And I'm surprised that none of the spads in the Treasury uh, spotted this elephant trap. And I hope between now <clears throat> and then the Government will either bring the support into line with other local government funding and run it through to the end of the year, or work up some alternative scheme to replace it, such as was mentioned by Baroness Lister. Otherwise, it will simply become a very hot uh, political issue. <laughs> Secondly, could I welcome the introduction of a British ISA, not mentioned so far in our debate, uh, notwithstanding some of the negative comments in the press, why backing British comes at a cost in the Times, and Jeremy's new ISA is a nonsense in the Sunday Times money section. That actually appeared a few pages after the business news that very same day, had a share tip, clean up with this firm, uh, backing a UK, UK firm making uh, cleaning products. My Lords, there is a good pedigree for this initiative, the Business Expansion Scheme, the Enterprise Investment Scheme, uh, Venture Capital Trusts, <clears throat> all aimed at encouraging investment in UK companies. And the British ISA extends uh, the principle to smaller investors and to UK quoted companies. Now, I take the point about definition on which the government is consulting, but can my noble friend uh, tell the House whether the scheme will be up and running before the general uh, election? Yeah. 
Uh, then I want to raise a point about stamp duty and the abolition of multiple dwellings relief on which I've written uh, to the Minister. I take the point about abuse which was mentioned in the budget debate, but there is an unforeseen consequence. In, in the housing debate which we had last Thursday, I made the point that we need to get long-term institutional finance into the private rented uh, sector to replace the private landlord who is now exiting. Such institutions often buy large numbers of properties before converting them into purpose-built flats. And those hoping to invest in student accommodation could be affected. And I wonder if my noble friend could have a look at this and see if the collateral <coughs> damage might be uh, avoided. On national insurance, I agree with Lord McPherson that it was right to cut national insurance. Though when he, a former uh, civil servant, described a government's decision as courageous, it took me back to several episodes of uh, Yes Minister. <laughs> but on the ambition to uh, abolish national insurance, I think achievable, a more achievable goal would be to merge it with income tax. The two are now sufficiently similar that merging is a plausible option, bringing increased transparency, reduced administrative costs and compliance costs, though there are some potential obstacles such as the uh, contributory uh, principle. Uh, my concern about the budget is not about this year, but about uh, the future. Real per capita day-to-day -day spending for unprotected departments is set to fall by 13% over the next five years, nearly as much as the so-called years of austerity. That's justice with the problems with the prisons and the courts, uh, local government with growing pressure on adult services and many local authorities at risk of going bankrupt, uh, pressure on the Home Office and policing. And I just asked myself, are those reductions really achievable and how the public might react uh, were they to uh, happen? Uh, finally, my Lords, <coughs> I was rereading the Ministerial Code over the weekend and I came across paragraph 9.1. I quote, When Parliament is in session, the most important announcements of government policy should be made in the first instance in Parliament. Mm. Now, no one doubts that the budget statement is just such a policy. <clears throat> so, my Lords, is the country not fortunate to have such perceptive economic correspondence in all our newspapers and media that independently they all came to the same conclusion that the only logical thing for the Chancellor to do was to cut national insurance by 2% and they then persuaded their editors to back their hunch sure. with a splash and a lead story? My Lords, I leave the alternative explanation hanging in the air. <laughs> <laughs> my Lords, it's always a pleasure to follow my noble friend, Lord Young of Cookham. My Lords, I look back at what I said in November when we debated the Chancellor's autumn statement. Uh, at my stage in life, that's a, a wise precaution, and an aid memoir is helpful. And for this non-dogmatic, non-ideological, pragmatic, prudence supporting and I hope compassionate Conservative, the autumn statement was an affirmation of my beliefs. And I remember criticism from both opponents and even some Conservatives. Predictably, the Labour Party found it tame, not spending enough, no surprise there. Some Conservative colleagues found it dull, not exciting enough. My Lords, I don't want the steward of our economy to be some flash Harry putting headlines, gimmicks and show above substance and prudence, nor do I want a wand-waving wizard treating the economy as some giant experimental laboratory. My noble friend, uh, Lord Lamont of Lerwick, could never have been described as either uh, in his role as Chancellor, and mercifully, neither can Jeremy Hunt as he quietly demonstrated in November and confirmed with his spring statement. Because the real test is market reaction, which remain stable. And I do remember in the November carping and criticism, context was a glaring omission. There was no reference to the extraordinary uh, challenges that we have faced, the pandemic, energy price hikes and inflation on the back of the illegal war in Ukraine. But, my lords, because of the steady approach to the economy by the Prime Minister and the Chancellor, I'm clear context is now being acknowledged, and people understand that. They needed and they got help with soaring energy bills. They know there isn't a magic money tree, but they are benefiting from falling inflation. And they have felt the support offered by the measures in the autumn statement, and they can see how that has been built on by the spring statement. Reaffirming the importance of context, the sobering economic reality is quite simply in paragraph 1.1 of the OBR Economic and Fiscal Outlook published earlier this month. 
and it gives an objective assessment of the challenges facing the Chancellor, confirming how tight his envelope is. Another helpful confirmation of why the last thing we need is either a flash Harry or a wand-waving wizard. Which is why I'm reassured by the Chancellor's approach. And in case anyone thinks I'm wallowing in a warm bath of self-delusion, let's look at the facts. At the beginning of 2023, we identified three economic priorities. Half, the inf half inflation, grow the economy, reduce debt. And as my noble friend the Minister indicated, inflation has fallen from 11.1% to 4%. The economy has performed better than forecast and outperformed European neighbours. And debt is on track to fall as a share of GDP to 92.9% in 2028-29. So the steady progress predicted last autumn is happening, and there is now scope to help further. And I was certainly, as other contributors have indicated, um, very, very pleasantly surprised by and supportive of the NIC changes, both to employee uh, main rate and self-employed main rate, because the combination of what we've done in the autumn and what we do now is going to make a real difference to uh, the working population, with wider benefits, as the noble Lord Lord Macpherson of Earl's Court um, pointed out. That is why I'll certainly be supporting the NIC bill at second reading later today. To grow the economy, we have to make it worthwhile for people to work. We have to let them keep more of their own money, and this delivers that encouragement. But, my laws, we also have to support people in work, get them back to work, and encourage new entrants into work, which these measures, plus changes to the child benefit scheme, will encourage. My laws, no one likes paying tax, but measures to help working families and be a catalyst to growing the economy justify putting a bit of the load on some of the broader shoulders. And I think the changes in tax treatment of non-DOMs are sensible. And I think recognising the extraordinary increases in receipts for the oil and gas sector, uh, extending the energy profits levy to 2029 with the safety valve of the built-in regulator, because it's there, does not seem oppressive. My laws, the other measures uh, covered by my noble friend, the Minister, are helpful. They're sensible for business and they offer support in still challenging times for millions of households. And the continued work in investment zones is spreading benefit right across the whole UK. My laws, looking ahead and anticipating a steady hand continues in the Treasury helm, the IMF forecasts that the UK will grow faster than Japan, Germany, France and Italy cumulatively over the next five years. And the OBR confirms that the economy grew last year and will be bigger at the end of the forecast period than they predicted last autumn. We now need to be thinking strategically about opportunities and innovation as to how we find money. I want to look at defence spend and I want to repeat what I aired in the recent foreign affairs debate in this House. This is the most threat-ridden world we've known since the Second World War. We've got to work with partnerships, we've got to provide leadership, and for NATO, that has to mean looking way beyond 2% of GDP. Now, during these highly charged times, if we're serious about the defence and security of this country, extraordinary measures are called for. And that measure, that measure is not just, that investment's not just to fund potential kinetic military activity. We need to be resourcing intelligence and cyber security measures. Not much point in pouring billions into a more productive health service if uh, activity is wiped out by a hostile cyber attack. I think for the, for the next uh, term, there is an argument for a finite period um, uh, to top slice the defense budget to give greater certainty about operational capability. I also believe the Treasury can be more imaginative in how it procures money to fund defence. My suggestion was to consider the issue of Patriot bonds. If we can issue green savings bonds and still popular premium bonds, why can't we replicate that model for defence? I think there is an appetite for it. Um, I realise the history of war loan stock may make the Treasury shudder but surely the Treasury expertise can find the model which boosts defence funding, balanced with security and attractive return to the investor. Now, I don't, of course, expect my noble friend, the Minister, to respond to all of that, but I do ask her to use a sharp elbow when she returns to the Treasury and points out this is not a gentle nudge from a friend, this is a cri de coeur as a matter of necessity. Now, in conclusion, my lords, there is one person for whom the autumn and spring statements create a headache. That's the Shadow Chancellor. I remember in November questioning the problematic 28 billion borrowing pledge. It's now gone. 
What next? No one knows. And despite the heroic efforts of Lord Equal, um, Labour's economic policy and fiscal proposals remain opaque and incoherent. By contrast, my laws, the Prime Minister and his Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, have set the sat-nav. We are travelling the journey. The scenery is inviting. And I think, my laws, the destination is exciting. Um, <clears throat> I, would, uh, I would like to talk about the nine million people that Lord Lamont talks about who are economically inactive. Is that right? Nine million? Just over nine million? It's interesting, is it not, that if you go to a bank and you look at what a bank does with its money, you will find that 80% of the transactions that a bank make um, are all about the buying and selling of property. That means 20% is about business. So these are the high street banks. That's where we keep our family jewels. That's where we keep all the um, property, all the prosperity has to seemingly pass through owning property. In Germany, it's the opposite. 20% of what the banks spend is spent on the buying and selling of property. So you have this really weird world. What I'd like to talk about is social housing. 19% of people in the UK live in social housing. We don't have enough. There's one and a half million people waiting to be put into social housing if it comes along. So we need to build social housing and we also need to build affordable housing so that we can break this situation where housing seems to be everybody's obsession. Whether it's the children of the middle classes or it's whether the people who inherit poverty from their parents. That's what I find so interesting. But the other thing I find so interesting is that actually only about 2% of people who get social housing ever have social mobility. Only about 2% of them will finish their levels or finish their leaving certificates and go to the college or go to the university or get a job which means that they can skill themselves away from poverty. So you have this enormous problem. You don't have churn in social housing. And in my opinion, what we need to be doing, what the government needs to be doing, is looking at why it is that we invest in social housing. But it's not the basis of building a life for a family. What it is, is building a life to guarantee that for the next hundred years, the children and the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren will be living in poverty. If we are talking about creating a growing economy, then we really do need to look at what is happening, what is actually happening in social housing. Because social housing, and if you look at the, uh, the statistics today, about 60% of people who use the A&E are people who come from social housing and from poor housing stock. If you look at the costs to the, to the NHS, 50% of it is spent on trying to keep the poorest amongst us as healthy as possible. So I'm not an economist, but one thing I am is I'm determined to raise the question again and again that if we are going to have social housing, that it has to be a basis of turning people, giving them accommodating potential and not simply warehousing people and putting them into social housing where they then become hard on themselves. Their lives are less and less able to be full and human. I say that. Thank you.
My lords, it is a privilege to follow the noble lord, Lord Bird, and his powerful speech, and it is with a strong sense of responsibility that I rise to speak for the first time in this chamber. Excellence in debate characterises your lordship's house, and we have already heard many outstanding speeches in the course of this debate. For my part, I carefully observed the work of the house before venturing to engage in its deliberations, and in that process I certainly benefited from the advice of noble lords from all parties and none. So may I thank all of those who have been so generous in welcoming me and granting me the benefits of their wise experience. And in particular can I thank my introducers, the noble lord, Lord Mott, and the noble lord, Lord Lancaster of Kimbolton. I would also like to extend my thanks to Blackrod, the doorkeepers, and all the staff of this house. As we all know, their guidance and support is invaluable. Turning to the important matter before us today, perhaps the House will allow me to focus on an aspect of this budget for which I have a personal passion. It is an area in which I have direct experience as an advisor to ministers, and it is an area that noble lords across the House have already touched on this afternoon. That is the question of the proper evaluation of government spending. During my time working in the Downing Street Policy Unit, I led efforts to establish the Evaluation Task Force, a Treasury and Cabinet Office team working to better understand and embed evidence in government spending decisions. My Lords, it is right that we devote significant time and effort to debating levels of public spending, but seldom do we discuss the lacuna that lies at the heart of government intervention itself. We simply do not understand whether many, often very expensive, government interventions actually succeed in bringing, out the, bringing about the outcomes they are intended to achieve. So I am glad that the Evaluation Task Force is now working on this, ensuring that evidence is more available and better understood across government. I therefore welcome the Treasury document published alongside this budget called Seizing the Opportunity, Delivering Efficiency for the Public, which was released along with the Public Sector Productivity Plan. It notes that, since the foundation of the task force, it has now worked with more than 300 government programmes, with a total value of around £140 billion to ensure that they have robust evaluation in place. I would also like to highlight the Evaluation Registry, which will become a publicly available online database of policy evidence, and the £15 million Evaluation Accelerator Fund, which will tackle the most pressing evidence gaps ahead of the next spending review. My Lords, I hope these reflections illuminate some of my policy interests, which are the process of government policymaking itself and, connectedly, the reform of government. And in concluding, I will briefly touch on my own background, which perhaps is a small example of the good that a reforming government and landmark budgets can do. It was a Conservative government instituting careful tax cuts and sensible deregulation that ultimately enabled my parents to become small business owners in Hertfordshire. So aspirational was my grandfather that he would hold up a copy of the newspaper in front of him at the breakfast table, even though he could not properly read. In just two generations, his grandson would go on to graduate from the University of Cambridge and would be published in many such newspapers as a journalist. And I say with apologies to the noble Lord, Lord Young of Cookham, also sometimes as a source briefing government policy. <laughs> Either way, it was a trajectory that was surely unimaginable to my forebears. So when I stood up a few moments ago to speak for the first time in your Lordship's house, I felt propelled by decades of their hard work and aspiration. And that is why I believe the crucial formula that should be at the heart of every budget is natural human ambition coupled with the innovation of private enterprise, matched by the springboard and safety net of the public sector, strengthened with the solidarity of family and community in a free society that is the formula that will transform opportunity into success. My Lords, I therefore welcome the bill before us today, 
in which the government brings forward measures to allow people to keep more of what they earn by their own efforts. It is only by widening economic opportunity that we can defeat a pernicious myth, and one I'm afraid that is being increasingly told to my generation. The false narrative that somehow the road to success is no longer open in this country to those who aspire to it. And I know that that was also the vision of the former Prime Minister who put me forward to serve in this place, and I pay tribute to him today, just as I pay tribute to my former team in the Conservative Research Department, which I had the privilege to lead. My Lord, since we are in election year, I will close by recalling a poster which sums up something of this spirit. It said something like, what did the Conservative Party do for a boy from Brixton? It made him Prime Minister. So I say today, what did a passion for policy and debate do for a boy from Stevenage? It would lead him to serve in your Lordship's house, and that is where I intend to contribute diligently with the benefit of the guidance of noble lords on the questions before us today, and I hope many more to come. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> My lords, it's, it's, um, I'm delighted to have the chance to follow immediately that excellent maiden speech by my noble friend, um, Lord Kempsell. Um, and of course, he's absolutely right about the, uh, as it were, the secret, I think he called it a lacuna, at the heart of government, which many commentators overlook, overlook um, that um, promoting grand new programs and promising this, that and the other is pretty easy. You can get very imaginative indeed about future spending uh, particularly if you're in the speech writing department. But when it comes to harsh implementation, the actual details of how you get these programs through, and whether you, when it comes to evaluation of whether they're getting anywhere near achieving the objectives, which one starts out with with such high hopes, that's quite another thing. The best laid plans go wrong. I, I can't remember whether it was uh, von Moltke or um, Klaus Klausowitz, who said, uh, um, the best laid strategy never survives the first encounter with the enemy. And this, uh, I hear there's so much talk about strategy, and we must have long term strategy. And events, I'm afraid, as Mr. McMillan long ago reminded us, tend to intervene, especially, I may say, in a populist age when government is passed press all the time, every day, in this chamber and in the other place, to do more and more, and yet when it's got less and less control to do so, less and less actual control. So these are the dilemmas of our times, and I, I greatly look forward to hearing my noble friend's counsels uh, based on his experience on these numerous problems. Now, if I may come to my comments on uh, the budget issue, um, obviously, <laughs> The popular cry, and it's the correct one, is that we need more investment. So uh, my questions are going to be, what does the budget do and the thinking surrounding it, and what steps are, are planned in changes in central government, what are being considered to reinforce long-term public and private public, uh, uh, mixed and, and, and private, investment in the infrastructure of this nation, which gives it the, the bone, the strength, the momentum to go forward. And, and my specific questions in my time are these. First of all, what encouragement to UK pension and insurance funds to, uh, uh, is, uh, is there in the budget or in government thinking at the moment? Uh, the government may feel it's short of funds, the government that came in in, 19, in 2010 felt it was short of funds. There was no more money. But in fact, outside government, there's a great deal of money. The pension insurance funds have uh, trillions uh, ready to invest. So do the sovereign, sovereign wealth funds of other countries. And I declare an interest as I advise one of the biggest of those. But of course, every time it comes to discussing where to invest, the need is to find investable projects. Uh, projects. It's no use talking about vaguely about long-term investment and social benefits and this, that and the other. That's important. That costs money. But, to, but what the private investor wants and the uh, investor with the, who wants a return is 
investable projects, no white elephants, no sort of um, sizable sea nuclear power stations, as I see with great disappointment is being planned. What are needed are clever arrangements with government backing, certainly, on the PSBR side, the public sector borrowing side, but also with, on the private sector side as well. Now, we have been there halfway with the private finance initiatives of um, 20 and 30 years ago, which had a bad side. <laughs> there was also some very good ones indeed. And um, this is, I think, where new creative thinking is now going to be needed uh, under whatever government um, in, the, in the next few years. Um, um, second, and following that, I think there is no hope of getting real momentum in our long-term investment structure, wherever the finance comes from, until the centre of government mess which we have in this country is cleared up. We do need to see a creation of a new office of management of the budget, reinforcing the Prime Minister's cross-cutting control of major projects, as my noble friend Lord Maud recommended in his excellent report, which hasn't been nearly enough evaluated and discussed. And it, of course, reflects very long conservative, long-standing conservative thinking. Some of us were at this 50 years, half a century ago, in urging that this is a necessary stage to get the whole of government infrastructure investment moving. So the, the Maud recommendation was, in fact, that, uh, I, this is what he said, a new office of budget and management should be created. This would include HM Treasury's current responsibilities for the allocation and control of public expenditure together with the centres of major cross-country functions, financial management, commercial procurement, digital project delivery and human resources. That's, I, I say here, here to that. And I've said here to that for decades now. We will, ne we will not get uh, the infrastructure investment needed and the real momentum behind it until that split in the Treasury is made and the Prime Minister's position, strategic position, is greatly reinforced. Third, my lords, what, of the, um, what about the Chancellor's growing commitment, which I listen to and greatly welcome, to increased retail investment in the financial sector, as well as investment from pensions and so on, retail sector for every family in the land to be shareholders, um, for wider ownership of all kinds, for shared ownership, community ownership, as is being developed in many other countries, but not fast enough here, for employee share ownership, very widespread in the United States. Uh, and I do hope, um, um, Lord McPherson mentioned earlier the uh, NatWest uh, sale. I hope that, that that is an opportunity for imaginative schemes to be developed. And I think we will hear from Lord Lee of Stratford, Stratford later on, but just one of them, which might help greatly. Finally, everyone's talking, and the economists are all talking about raising productivity, and ideas abound on how this should be done. My Lords, there is one quite simple answer that gets overlooked, uh, and that is, of course, uh, to encourage, to make ourselves as a nation highly attractive, even more than we do, for foreign direct investment. It hasn't been too bad, but it's not as powerful as it should be. And I ask, have we learnt, I ask my noble friend, have we learnt from the 1970 to 90 success in attracting an enormous wave of Chinese inward investment, which had the direct effect of increasing productivity? New machinery came in, but better than that, old restrictive practices, uh, then being pushed much too hard by the trade unions, were thrown out. Uh, the Japanese refused to work with those. Uh, the, our car industry was rescued from the last attentions of Mr. Ben and others from its poor state and transformed. Our electronic industries were transformed. A lot of new investment was brought to the Welsh Valleys. And these are the areas where the new momentum is now required. Um, and of course, uh, my noble friend Lord Harrington's excellent report makes some very useful recommendations on how to do it, all pointing in the same direction of a much more powerful push at the centre than we have had in the past. And my lords, we, 
We, we need to become a, a financially literate nation, a nation that understands that investment means savings, savings means uh, organising those savings and drawing on them in a way that attracts them uh, in a steady stream. And if we can get uh, investment up, then the benefits of investment must be far more widely shared. Uh, politicians mouth the, the phrase that capitalism must work for everyone. Well, it clearly doesn't. It doesn't. And it must be made to work for everyone. And it can be, in contrast to the uh, capitalisms, distorted state capitalisms of Asia, such as the Chinese state capitalism or the mafia gangster capitalism of Moscow. So, from the conservative government, which we have now, although I would hope from all parties and all governments uh, in this post-socialist age, we need to hear a lot more about that, about sharing the benefits of asset growth and investment for the people. So that is the path we should be on, and I believe we should concentrate on it with much more vigour. Whoever's in charge politically at Westminster than we have done in the last 50 years. First, can I congratulate the noble Lord, Lord Kempsall, on his uh, excellent, um, informative and measured maiden speech. I'm sure he will be an asset to the House. Uh, I wanted to speak mainly about, uh, to, to question the, uh, the, the government about their proposals on national insurance, which is clearly a major part of the budget and have given rise to the bill that's before us today. Uh, there's a couple of other points I'd like to make first. First, to point out that there is no serious independent commentator who thinks that the government's fiscal rule makes any sense whatsoever. The government claim that it uh, demonstrates that they are behaving responsibly, uh, but clearly it's nonsense. Uh, any parameter which depends on the difference between two enormous and uncertain figures isn't going to work in any practical way, but even on its own terms. Uh, we have fantasy income, the, the, uh, the treatment of the fuel levy is only one example, and we have fantasy expenditure. So, rather than demonstrating the government's responsibility, their fiscal rule actually illustrates their irresponsibility. A second point is their claim, the government's claim that it wants a tax system that rewards and incentivizes work. If that were anywhere near true, how does that explain the continued favorable treatment of what, amongst the older ones amongst us, uh, used to be called unearned income. Income from rent and from uh, property is significantly lower than income from work. If the government were interested in uh, incentivising work, the burden of taxation could be shifted from work onto these other areas which are currently taxed at lower rates. Turning to national income, I am a strong supporter of the National Insurance Scheme. It has lasted for about 150, 113 years since it was first introduced as a term by Lloyd George and was brought into full effect by the, the post-war Labour government under the leadership of Jim Griffiths, who I would suggest uh, needs to be honoured as much as that other um, uh, uh, leader of that government and Aaron Bevan. I'm a strong supporter of national insurance because it provides a system of paying contributions while you at work and you receive benefits when you can't work, whether because of illness, unemployment or retirement. That was the system that was established and the fact that we still use the term national insurance now, I think, demonstrates 
the continued support that that approach to providing social benefits continues to enjoy. So as a strong supporter of national insurance, I would like, uh, no Baroness, the Minister, to tell us what on earth the government is up to. Uh, the proposals that have been floated over the, uh, since the budget it bear all the hallmarks of a bright idea from a Tufton Street AstroTurf think tank, ill thought out, ill considered and ill formed. Now someone's got a plan, we just don't know what it is, but I think we're entitled to, go, to know. I think it's absolutely wrong for the Prime Minister or the Chancellor to float ideas without explaining the full implications of what they're saying. Because unless they provide us with the full implications, their ideas are worthless. And so there's two key questions. What is going to, which arise from the effect of removing one leg of the national insurance arrangement, i.e. national insurance contributions? Firstly, they have to tell us where the money is going to come from. Is it, as was sort of suggested, from massive economic growth, which suggests that the entire focus of economic growth will be, uh, you, bonus from economic growth, will be devoted to removing national insurance contributions? Well, for my part, I think there's certainly more important priorities than that. So I think the government needs to tell us where is the money going to come from, and they also need to tell us what exactly are the implications that it has for contributory benefits, as my noble friend, Baroness Lister Burton said, has said. We have a contributory system. If you remove the contributions, you have to tell us what you're going to do with the contributory benefits. My main focus is on pensions, but it applies equally to uh, pre-retirement benefits as well. So I hope the noble Baroness uh, can explain a bit more about what's in the mind, because if, unless they provide further information and clarity about the idea, uh, they are seriously misleading people about their intentions. My Lords, I'm very glad to follow Lord Davies of Brixton and hear his analysis and his comments on uh, NICs. I've had a long interest in the, N the contributory system and how it developed in the interwar and the post-war years, but today I'm not going to speak on NICs. Um, I'd also like to welcome Lord Kemsel, whose maiden speech brings a flavour of the thoughtful approach to improving government policy deployed in his different roles, most recently in the Prime Minister's office. I look forward to his fresh insights in your Lordship's debate as he shares his knowledge and experience, including that of the conduct of the country's affairs at one of the great moments of recent history. I am grateful to my noble friend, the Minister, for her helpful discussion of the budget, and I set my comments in the context outlined by uh, the noble Lord, Lord Lamont, um, that the modest improvements we have seen um, are to be welcomed, and that UK growth, though not terrifically high, is among, in, better than many in, of the countries of Europe than that in many of the countries of Europe, and better, and our tax base, our tax burdens, while still a little high, too high in fact in my view, are still less burdensome and less onerous than the tax burdens of many of our fellow citizens in Europe. And it's in that context that I put my questions to my noble friend. Um, UK GDP growth has not been, as I meant, very high. By 2028, it is projected to be 1.7% against an inflation figure of 2%. The ONS estimates that GDP per capita decreased by 0.7% last year, 2023, 
and it is suggested by the OBR and highlighted in the library note by the Lord's research team, for which I'm very grateful, that the fall is because of the increase in population. Our population is now over 67 million people. In 1950, it was 50 million people. It is projected to be 70 million in 2026. Can, can the minister elaborate on, elaborate on the link between rising population and a de decrease in <coughs> GDP per head, and how the government sees projections for GDP per capita and for immigration, given the 2023 figures um, indicating 672,000 people, um, a figure which represents net migration for this year. Moving on to public debt and borrowing, I welcome the projected cut in public sector net, net, net borrowing as a share of GDP, from 3.1% of GDP today to 1.2% in 2028-29. Nonetheless, the figures for public sector net debt, excluding the Bank of England, are more disappointing. It is expected to rise to 93%. 93.2% as a percentage of GDP by 2027-28 and down slightly to 92.9 in 2028-29. For these reasons, and because public spending at 44.5% is still too high for the reasons the noble um, minister, noble baroness, the minister gave, Public spending at these levels and pump public debt require high levels of tax to service both public spending and debt interest. And for these reasons, I would like to ask whether the tax cuts announced by the government in the budget, it, rather than prioritizing tax cuts, we should be prioritizing taking the side to levels overall of public spending and public debt. I don't think that this will have a terrific Im impact on the provision of public services, given the UN Human Development Index reveals that countries with lower public spending as a proportion of GDP very often have better output and better public services. Um, countries like Switzerland, uh, Canada and other European countries can do far better in health and education outcomes with far lower levels of public spending as a, a, a proportion of GDP. Moving on to inflation, reassuring as it may be to hear that inflation is now on a downward trend, I would urge that never again must the Bank of England and its official advisers be permitted to turn a blind eye to the growth of money each year, the quantity of money supply, and that they must be obliged to take account of it. The Economic Affairs Committee of this House recommended in its November 23 report that to address the errors made in the conduct of monetary policy by the wider central banking community, including the Bank of England, it had heard evidence from a number of witnesses, including those who pointed to the, fi to the failure to take account of the money supply. The committee recommended that the bank must do more to foster a diversity of view and strengthen, strengthen a culture that encourages challenges, and that the absence of any detailed discussions about money supply in the bank's published monetary policy reports should include now, from now on, discussion of the main monetary aggregates accompanied by an analysis of their relevance to the bank's inflation outlook and the various scenarios the Monetary Policy Committee considers to ensure adequate transparency in how the bank approaches its monetary policy decision-making. This advice was echoed, um, or what followed, um, that of an author whom I published, and I declare an interest in, as research director of Politaire, Tim Congdon, and Professor Congdon proposed that the bank governor be obliged to write a letter, and whenever money growth is too high or too low relative to the 2% inflation target, the governor must tell the Chancellor of the Exchequer 
why the deviant behaviour of the quantity of money will prove compatible with future inflation close to the 2% target, which my noble friend is, will be, uh, is determined to meet. So may I conclude by asking my noble friend, the Minister, what steps have been taken in the light of the Economic Affairs Committee's recommendations and whether the Governor of the Bank's open letter system um, might now include references to money and require an explanation about why rapid money growth or money contraction will not lead to inflation far, far beyond the permitted band. Thank you. I too would like to welcome the noble Lord, Lord Kempsell, on and congratulate him on his uh, maiden speech because, in fact, it was concise and it was interesting, so that bodes really well for future contributions. Um, and uh, I recognise the scenario that the noble Lord, Lord Eatwell, put forward. Uh, I didn't really recognise the scenario that the noble lady and the minister put forward. I think we are in a terrible mess in this country, and this budget actually. It, it doesn't do anything for it, and it's not really even a, a debate at all because we've got two parties arguing over the same set of policies while the general public see their taxes misspent on a mix of corrupt contracts and privatised services. It doesn't seem very fair, really. The reality of the UK today is that a lot of hard-working people get paid less than they were uh, a decade ago, while the very richest get even richer. There's been no austerity for Conservative Party donors and the friends of Cabinet Ministers. They came out of Covid richer as a result of the fast-track PPE contracts. And now, of course, they're paying less tax with fewer regulations and the ability to stow away their money in offshore trusts. And Brexit has failed to benefit Cornish fishermen or voters in Sedgefield, Wrexham or Lee. And levelling up is an excuse that enables the government to channel public money to marginal Conservative seats. The whole Thatcher project has failed, yet politicians of both the two major parties treat it as sacred text. For example, North Sea oil and gas has made Norway one of the richest countries in Europe from the 1980s onwards, with an oil fund worth approximately $1.4 trillion. Revenue from this fund accounts for a fifth of government spending. <coughs> and the UK should be even better off, but we handed it all over to the private sector. So the result is energy customers being ripped off in the last two years with record high energy bills and record high profits for the oil and gas industries. Instead of coming out of the last 50 years with a thriving economy, we live in a country where things are falling apart and nothing works. I, I, anyone who walks around towns will see the lack of investment because councils are struggling they're going bust up and down the country. The NHS waits are getting longer. Dentists can't be found. And these headline cut tax cuts will do nothing to reverse the decades-long real-terms wage freeze that most workers have faced, faced under successive Conservative governments. And you have to ask, where did all the money that we had, when Margaret Thatcher took power, where did all the money go? And, of course, we have 171 billionaires now, which we didn't have before, which is obviously something you know, we should all be proud of. But you have to ask, why isn't a wealth tax the number one priority for both, both parties, especially the Labour Party, at the next election? It would enable this country to finally invest in large-scale renewables and the insulation of homes. And a wealth tax, of course, could deliver cheaper energy and lower bills, which is exactly what the majority of us need. Rail privatisation has led to far higher fares at a time when the climate crisis dictates that we need lower fares, more trains, fewer cars. And water privatisation has given us sewage in our rivers, higher bills and a collapsing infrastructure. Plus, water bills are due to go up another £125 on average this year to generate the £56 billion needed to fix our leaky pipes and overloaded sewage system. And oddly, that's a very similar amount to what the water companies have paid out in dividends. Mm -hmm. They took the money and they didn't do the work. And I don't see any sort of uh, penalty from that from the government. There's been a few, um, a few fines, but they pay those really happily. And what we should be doing is actually, instead of asking for fines, we should be taking shares. The solution to our economic decline is not privatisation of the NHS or anything else. 
its public ownership of railways and water and the NHS and an end to taxpayers being ripped off by dodgy contracts. The Green Party wants this country to have its future back and that means really change the way that we manage our economy and the environment that we live in and it means clean water, clean air and clean politics. Now the Green Party is putting together a manifesto at the moment for the general election and it will have a uh, fully costed budget which I'm really happy to share with well, with all political parties, really, because we do need a little bit of forward thinking in all of our decisions over the, over the next few years. Yep. We are in trouble as a, as a human race, and somehow nobody seems to get this. They just don't understand the urgency of what we have to do. And so I would argue that uh, this budget, I mean fairly useless, really, and um, I look forward to sharing the Green Party budget with everybody so you can see what good ideas look like. <laughs> My Lords, it gives me no pleasure to describe our country today uh, as pothole Britain. For years we've lived beyond our means, compounded of course by Covid and Brexit. Most public services uh, are in dire need of greater resources. National morale is very, very low indeed. Of course, I'm supportive of some of the individual measures in the budget, support of creative industries, changes to child benefit, and a focus on life sciences uh, and uh, artificial intelligence. And of course, I understand the politics of the 2% reduction in national insurance. But I believe the monies that, that have been saved there would be better spent, much better spent on defence, where I think the argument to spend more is compelling at the present time, on our prisons, on dentistry, on youth services, on the police and social housing referred to by the noble Lord, Lord Bird. But my focus today is on two things, the disposal of the NatWest shares and also on ISAs, the British ISA referred to by the noble Lord Lord Young, uh, and of course um, Lord Macpherson referred to the disposal of, uh, uh, of NatWest shares. I think we all agree that financial education in our schools has been lamentable. The National West disposal, the, gov the government's holding, the 30 odd percent holding, gives, I believe, uh, the country a unique opportunity uh, of actually uh, improving financial education. If the Chancellor goes down the, the SID route, which is what he's, he's talking about, um, then I believe that there is a, a, a real opportunity here, uh, an opportunity that myself and a number of senior members of your Lordship's House, including Lord Lamont and Lord Howell, uh, have put to government. Uh, and our idea is that government gives by way of gift, something like £5,000 worth of NatWest shares free to all our state secondary schools if they would like those shares. With, with just over 4,000 state secondary schools, that would probably cost around £20, £22 million, pounds, assuming full take-up, which frankly is a pretty small amount in, in terms of overall government spend. These shares would have to be held for the long term. A £5,000 NatWest shareholding would give, at the present time, a dividend to the school of th about £350 a year. And our idea is that the pupils themselves would be empowered to decide, the pupils themselves to decide, how that £350 or the annual dividend is actually spent. They might decide, for example, to spend it on something for the school, uh, to subsidise a school trip, for example, to support a local charity, uh, or even to, to reinvest in some form. But it would be their decision, their decision. Also, of course, because the school would own the shares, they would be able, the school would be able to participate uh, in, the in the national NatWest AGM. And indeed, NatWest may well spend, uh, send speakers into the schools to um, uh, spread the word on financial, financial education. This scheme, I believe, would be transformative, and for the first time, for the first time, 
would begin to encourage uh, and make youngsters aware uh, of uh, what banks are, what the stock market is, uh, what dividends are. In the Treasury Select Committee last Wednesday, um, uh, John Barron asked the Chancellor uh, about this scheme, which, uh, which uh, he has been put to him, and his reply was that it's under consideration. Uh, and obviously, I very much welcome that. If a scheme like this is actually uh, implemented, then I believe we could build on it by encouraging regional public companies to, to gift a small proportion of shares to the secondary schools, state secondary schools, in their locality, from where their, uh, uh, their, employ where their employees' children go uh, and, indeed, where they recruit from. Turning to um, ISAs and the concept of a British ISA, uh, I've been a great supporter of, uh, uh, of this whole concept, uh, starting to invest when PEPs, the precursor of ISAs, came in in 1987. ISAs have probably developed into the best tax-free wrapper uh, in the Western world, and many of my overseas foreign friends are envious of, um, uh, of the ISA. And, of course, it's been a very successful, a very successful savings medium. And the newspapers over the weekend, of course, have been full of, uh, uh, of, of uh, ISIS and ISA, uh, and ISA content. And, of course, I'm very supportive, would be very supportive uh, of anything that gives a boost to the UK stock market. But I have to say that the, uh, the £5,000 British ISA, which is suggested um, in the budget, uh, frankly, is somewhat of a, a damp squib. Uh, I think it will be administratively very, very difficult and complex. You're probably be talking about having to run two ISAs. It will obviously appeal only to the very wealthy, who will be able to put in something like 25,000 a year, 20 plus the five. And frankly, it hardly produced a, it hardly produced a flicker uh, in stock market interest. There were no movements at all. I have to say, I'm pleased to say that my own ISA um, is actually 100% invested in UK stocks, which actually perhaps explains its rather poor performance in, uh, in recent years. Uh, but more seriously, um, there is a fundamental choice here, a real fundamental choice, I would suggest. If, if individual savers and investors want to invest in overseas stocks, by all, by all means, let them. That is their decision. But I don't believe that we should be giving tax incentives via ISAs to those who invest overseas. Why should we? It doesn't make sense. And therefore, while I think it would be difficult to retrospectively uh, argue that people should dispose of their overseas holdings, I think from now on, those who take out new ISAs, whether they be for 20,000 or 5,000 or whatever the figure is, should actually be restricted to UK stocks sole, as it were, and if they want to invest in overseas stocks, then um, that is for their decision. But there shouldn't be tax breaks supporting. Thank you. Um, my Lords, I'll start by being positive about the budget and talk about the things that I like. First, tax cuts are good, and so I support the reductions in national insurance contributions. Uh, this, in particular, will increase incentives to work. Uh, secondly, the longer-term ambition to eliminate employee <coughs> national insurance contributions is excellent and will help to simplify the tax system. The contributory uh, principle has been a fiction for a very long period of time, though I note that the benches opposite haven't yet caught up with that. And I hope that the Chancellor will also look at employers' national insurance, uh, which is a tax on jobs and therefore a disincentive to job creation. I find it bizarre that we tax people-intensive businesses more highly than capital-intensive ones. Uh, thirdly, I support the focus on increasing public sector productivity. Too often fingers are pointed at the private sector when discussing the UK's poor productivity performance, uh, and the 20% or so of our GDP uh, generated in the public sector uh, has often been in negative territory. Uh, and has been a significant drag on our overall performance. Now, because the NHS um, 
sucks up so much of our public sector resources each year, it was inevitable that the Chancellor would look there first. But I have to say that my heart sank when I heard him talk about stuffing several billion pounds worth into NHS IT. Uh, the NHS's history is littered with IT failures. Uh, and if the government go ahead with this, they really must hold NHS England uh, to account and not let them off the hook this time. Now, fourthly, I was thrilled to see that the Laffer curve uh, has been embraced. I have often extolled this in debates in your Lordship's House. I agree with the noble Lord Lord Equal on many things, but on this, I definitely do not agree with him. But the, the reduction in the capital gains tax rate on residential property is pretty small beer in the overall budget arithmetic, but it is a start, and I hope that the Chancellor will pursue tax rate reductions with more fervour uh, in the future. Uh, the OBR recognises the dynamic effect of tax changes only to a very <coughs> limited extent, and the Chancellor must not let the OBR be a roadblock to more reductions uh, in tax rates in the future. Now, my Lords, I really wanted to find more things to praise in the budget. I tried very hard, but I failed. This is yet another budget which delivers very little to break out of the low growth, low productivity rut in which we find ourselves. We have a high tax economy. Tax at 37% of GDP by 2028 is nothing to be proud of. We have fiscal drag, we have high marginal rates for individuals, we have a high rate of corporation tax and windfall taxes, all piled on top of a vastly complex tax system. And these are just some of the features of our current tax landscape. It is no wonder that in last year's tax competitiveness index, the UK was number 30 out of 38 countries, three places lower than the previous year. Uh, we also spend too much. Public expenditure is way over 40% of GDP, and while it's on a downward trajectory, uh, nobody really believes uh, that that will happen, absent detailed plans of how that is to be achieved. It is possible to get public expenditure down, but it will not be achieved by pub productivity gains alone. At the end of the day, we will have to stop doing some things. It will be very hard work but I can see no evidence in the budget papers of a commitment to doing that. The Chancellor labelled uh, his budget as a long-term growth budget, but the truth is that it lacks a single-minded focus on growth. Uh, the Chancellor's speech was complacent on our recent dismal growth figures and failed even to acknowledge that we seem to have slipped into a technical recession uh, at the second half of last year. The Chancellor seems to think that by bullying pension funds into investing in UK activities, activities that amounts to a pro-growth policy. But, my Lords, I think that amounts to a suboptimal pensions policy. And while I rarely agree with the Chairman of the Infrastructure Commission, he hit the nail on the head last week when he emphasised that pension funds need to invest for the benefit of current and future pensioners, and that means investing in the best investment opportunities <coughs> wherever they are found. Uh, the, new K, uh, the new UK only ISA, as announced in the budget, is not much more than a gimmick. Apart from the new ISA being unlikely to have any significant impact on anything, the consultation shows that this is just another complicated scheme in an already complicated savings landscape. There are already five different types of ISA. We do not need a sixth, especially one which could well prohibit savers from making rational investment decisions. My Lord's growth will not come from this tinkering. A complete... A, a key plank of supply side reform is deregulation, especially for smaller businesses. It cannot be said too often 
that businesses just want to be, get, be left to get on with running their businesses. Every minute spent on the complex web of regulation which successive governments have spun around the business world is a minute not spent on wealth creation. Large companies love regulation because it squashes smaller competitors. A proper conservative government would smash through this. There was not even a mention in this budget. My Lords, I am used to being disappointed by budgets pro produced by conservative chancellors. This one was no exception. Uh, I, I'm afraid I don't share the noble lady's admiration for the Laffer curve, as I shall uh, try to explain a, a little later. The, the opportunity given this House by a debate on the budget is not to vote on its proposals, of course, we haven't got the power to do that, but to probe the fiscal philosophy which underpins them and see if it makes any sense. And that's what I'd like to spend a few minutes doing. It's not an easy task. Walter Badgett said of a well-known 19th century politician that his success lay in leaving out the premises on which his arguments depended. And one can say the same about Jeremy Hunt. He is no, no Nigel Lawson who had no fear in displaying his premises. In his May's lecture of 1987, Lawson said that it was the task of macro policy to control inflation and of micro policy to secure full employment, reversing the Keynesian wisdom of his day. And this has been roughly the philosophic stance of British gov governments, both Conservative and Labour, ever since. The Bank of England was entrusted with the control of inflation. Reforms in the product and labour markets, like deregulation and weakening trade unions, were relied on to reduce unemployment to its natural level. That is, full employment, as, as, as was then understood, was subsequently understood to be. If we look at the Hunt budget from this point of view, one, one fact stares out his assumption that the British economy is now at full employment. The headline unemployment rate is 3.8% and is forecast to stay at 4%, that is about 1.5 million of a total labour force of 32 million for the next two years. The lowest rate for 16 years, as the Chancellor was quick to point out. And this is about as good as it gets, surely. What it seems to show is that there is no spare capacity in the British economy. Our problem is uh, a, shortage, a shortage, not a surplus of labour. But this is a statistical miasma, I think. 9.25 uh, million of the working age population is classed as economically inactive. That is an inactivity rate of about 22%. To argue that in this sit situation the economy is at full employment, that there's no spare capacity, seems to me perverse. It's much more in line with common sense to say that a proportion of that 22% would want to work if there was a demand for their labour. In short, I would argue that we have a Keynesian problem of deficient demand and not just one of insufficient or inefficient supply. This doesn't show up in the headline unemployment numbers, but in the withdrawal of part of the population from participation in the economic life of the community. And it's worth remembering that Keynes didn't talk about unemployment equilibrium, that was a later phrase, but underemployment equilibrium. Uh, and I think that we are, um, we've had this situation for a number of years. Whatever the supply side contribution to it, and of course I, I understand the rise in poverty, disability, uh, mismatch of skills and, 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 and jobs, nevertheless insufficient demand has played a part. My Lords, we're told that uh, inflation is on the downward trend due to the Bank of England's high interest rates and the government's sound fiscal policies. But Completely ignored in this assessment is the influence of energy prices on inflation. Has the OBR factored in the increase in energy costs which would follow, for example, from the closure of the Suez Canal? 
a real possibility. We need to remember that inflation is not caused just by expanding the money supply at full employment. We had stagflation in the 1970s when inflation was due to a supply shock. My Lords, an important aspect of the sound money policy the Chancellor credits with bringing down inflation was the fiscal austerity practiced by successive Conservative governments after 2010. And I quote, it was only because we responsibly reduced the deficit by 80% between 2010 and 2019 that we could provide the 370 billion to help families and businesses in the pandemic. The alternative view, which I share, is that the austerity policy prevented a full UK recovery from the Great Recession of 2008-2010. Had George Osborne not slashed public spending, the UK would have been in a much better fiscal position to face the pandemic. And as I wrote in the Financial Times in 2010, austerity in the capital budget is the worst possible remedy for a slump. And I stick by that. Now, so now we come to the Laffer curve. Um, lower taxes means higher growth. To justify this claim, um, he produced the Laffer curve, uh, Jeremy Hunt, like, like a rabbit out of his hat. Um, but of course, there's no correlation over time, as the noble Lord, Lord Eatwell, pointed out, between tax rates and growth rates. The most prosperous period in modern history was the three decades after the Second World War, when the highest marginal tax rates were at 90%, and literally no one was allowed to become a billionaire. Even becoming a millionaire was quite difficult. Now, the last point I'd like to make, my Lords, is that although Labour has been rightly critical of this budget, it occupies much of the same intellectual territory as um, the Conservative government, and that has been common territory since um, the, the, the Lawson uh, 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 re re revolution of the 1980s. And um, so that means that while the Conservatives offer what we might call old-fashioned supply-side policy, Labour offers new supply-side policy, which Rachel Reeves called Securonomics. Well, to my mind, um, this is uh, not, um, uh, this is a, a, a very uh, a weak position because it, it invites the question, where is the money to come from? Unless you um, actually believe that there is a de demand shortage, you, 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 you can't face that problem, and it's been followed by the withdrawal of the pledge um, to uh, spend uh, a, a large sum of money on, on green investment. So I would just uh, remind the House that um, uh, all pra practical men are, are, are all slaves of, 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 of economists uh, who said that, and economics will have to do better to provide a philosophic underpinning for public policy. Join in to the congratulations to Lord Kempsell uh, on an excellent and inspirational uh, maiden speech to us just now. And can I welcome this budget is yet another example of prudent management of our economy whilst trying to stimulate growth, which I'm afraid to disagree with Lord Skidelsky, mainly comes through lower taxation wherever possible. Of course, the Chancellor is under huge constraints from all sorts of directions, not least the OBR. The OBR this year had at least the grace to say that, I quote, inflation has receded more quickly than we expected in November, and markets now expect a sharper decline in interest rates. This strengthens near-term growth prospects and should enable a faster recovery in living standards from last year's financial record decline. But despite that, they seem to impose a rigour on the Treasury which has frustrated the Treasury from being more generous in reducing the tax take and thus reducing the take for the state, which we all want to see, certainly on this side of the House, most eloquently put by Baroness Noakes. We all understand why the OBR was created. It followed a spending spree when Gordon Brown took the government debt in July 2007 from 35.5% of GDP to 56.8% in just two years. This was the beginning of all our difficulties. Lord Desai, not currently in his place, frequently reminds us that comparing debt to income, as we always do when quoting the level of government debt, isn't actually the best way of evaluating debt. 
However, many have commented that the OBR is now obsessed with, so obsessed with fiscal headroom that it distorts all decision making. Who predicted COVID, Ukraine, the Middle East war? How can anyone reasonably claim to predict what will happen in some five years' time, least of all economic forecasters who, as J.K. Galbraith reminded us, are there to make astrologers look respectable? <laughs> the, the forecasting errors over the years have been enormous, some £400 billion over the last two de decades, according to some, and this dependency on the OBR is no longer healthy. We must look at better ways to allow sensible policymakers to take a view on the forecasts and determine what they think is right, not just hoping that a few folk in the OBR, which has a very weak track record, might have just cracked it this time. The OBR themselves say, we continue to emphasize the uncertainties around our forecast in the light of rapidly changing economic conditions and the possibility that any of our key judgments could prove significantly too optimistic or too pessimistic. <coughs> Turning to specifics, as the Chairman of the Finance Bill Select Committee, which is a subcommittee of the Economic Affairs Committee of your Lordship's House, can I welcome the decision of HMRC to create an expert advisory panel to advise it on what is true and proper research and development? To remind your Lordship's latest estimate for the R&D tax credit costs are some £6.5 billion, and there is so much fraud and inaccuracy in, this, in the claims from in respect of R&D, that HMRC's own accounts had to be qualified over this specific uncertainty. Can I also comment that the change in the non-DOM regime may not be quite as harsh as one might have first thought from the Chancellor's speech, as with the transitionary rules and overseas work relief being retained and also rebasing capital gains tax to 2019 values, uh, it may not be too bad. Certainly, the ability to bring in stockpile gains outside of trusts at 12% into the UK is helpful, and the taxation of protective trusts has to be the right step forward if the scheme is going to work. Likewise, the scheme for non-DOMs on inheritance tax seems fair, with a 10-year window quite generous. I am pleased to see the Government are open to extensive consultations on this issue, which I believe have already started. The OBR reckon this will yield some five billion a year, but with migration, as will inevitably happen, uh, and other tax planning measures, this will drop by some two billion to a net three billion, in their opinion. It's very hard to know how they could possibly arrive at this, as they acknowledge themselves they really don't know. What we do know is that this does deprive Labour of one of their main sources of extra income, albeit they may have spent it several times over, and leaves them only with VAT on schools, which will probably lead to a, a net increase in cost to the Treasury, as we heard in oral questions this afternoon, as pupils transfer to the state system, and then also taxation on carry at higher rates, which I hear they have already rowing back on, as they realise it will not yield extra revenue. So it would be good to learn from the Labour front benches today or soon how they plan to raise extra taxes for all their extra expenses, as it's clear their employment proposals will almost certainly lead to a huge increase in unemployment as it always does in each and every Labour government, meaning more strain on government resources. Can I touch on what wasn't in the budget and might have been? I will spare my noble friend a plea for the digital services tax to try and properly tax online retailers such as Amazon, as her predecessors have clearly decided against this. And I also will spare her any further reference to, as she puts it, my favourite minority sport, EIS, again, as, once again, there was nothing in the budget which there should have been to raise thresholds and reduce restrictions. Now we're free from the yoke of the EU. So can I mention VAT? I worked with a number of peers from across the House on the Economic Crime and Corporate Transparency Act, which was a great success in the area of tightening up companies' house after the registration of some 11,000 companies to one flat in Wales. But we really didn't focus on why people were doing this, and the answer is, of course, to evade, not avoid, evade VAT. Great progress has been made in forcing online offshore retailers to pay VAT, but we really are not done yet. The National Audit Office has started an investigation into this area, and I wish it well, as we've seen many examples of companies using other people's VAT details and, and even companies that are shown as not trading on companies' house. Hundreds of companies, all connected to one source of stock, with each company staying below the ro radar and folding if caught. It has not been dealt with and remains a problem. 
The one area I would ask my noble friend to consider is the removal of VAT checks on items of £135 in value or less entering in the UK. This is, not, this is not helpful and there is huge evasion going on. HMRC assumes that any non-UK seller who sells into the UK will either sell on an online marketplace where VAT is collected now or register for VAT in the UK and pay the VAT direct to the HMRC. This is just not happening. It's a ridiculous assumption, and there is nothing that will make a non-UK seller register for VAT in the UK, particularly if they sell on websites or marketplaces outside of the UK. It's an enormous gaping hole in the UK's virtual customs border, and it's astonishing it was ever allowed. Other European countries have removed this £135 exemption, and we should as well. I appreciate it's a bit much to ask my noble friend for a response on this matter, which isn't in the budget today, so I look forward to a later reply. Finally, can I send, end on the sentence, remarked upon, I think, by Baroness Noakes, in the Chancellor's speech, which should be cut and pasted on every wall in the Treasury, when he said, the Treasury and the OBR have concluded that if we reduce the higher 28% rate that exists for residential property, we would, in fact, increase revenues. My Lords, I too welcome Noble Lord Kempsell uh, to this House and look forward to hearing from him uh, very soon. Uh, for the last 14 years, seven chancellors carrying red boxes rather than red noses have promised to rejuvenate the economy, eradicate poverty, cut taxes and improve public services. But what they have actually delivered is lower living standards, high taxes, worse public services and transferred wealth to the rich. This year's budget is no different. No one can actually grow an economy by depressing household incomes. The real average in wage is stuck at the 2007 level. In February 2024, according to the ONS, the median annual pay was £27,972. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation estimates that a single person needs an income of 29,500 to have a minimal standard of living and a couple with two children needs at least 50,000. So a large part of our population is below the level of a decent living standard. So rather than helping, the government has actually piled on the agony. Since March 2021, 4.2 million more individuals have been dragged into paying income tax because the tax thresholds have been frozen. By 2028-29, another 3.7 million workers will be forced to pay income tax at a basic rate of 20%, another 2.7 million at 40%, and another 200,000 at 45%. The government will collect 41.1 billion extra, which no doubt will be handed to more billionaires. So a rise in personal allowance, at least in line with inflation, would have helped to lift millions out of poverty. But the government chose not to do that. The 2P national insurance cut gives zero benefit to 17.8 million adults with income below £12,570. When I raised that point with the noble lady minister on 21st February, she said, and I quote, does the noble lord want me to give them a tax cut for taxes that they do not pay? I have now news for the minister. The poorest fifth pay 28.3% of their disposable income in indirect taxes, such as VAT, compared to 9% for the richest fifth. So can the minister explain what the budget offers to the 17.8 million poorest and why indirect taxes such as VAT have not been slashed to help the poorest. The, bill, the budget extends the high income child benefit threshold from 50,000 to 60,000 with a taper extended to 80,000. Some 500,000 families would benefit by around £1,300 next year. In sharp contrast, the two child benefit cap which hits the poorest depriving 402,000 families of around £3,200 a year has actually been retained. So can the Minister explain 
why, why the two-child benefit cap has not been abolished. Wages and salaries are taxed at the marginal rates of 20% to 45%, but capital gains are taxed at much lower rates. Instead of ending this discrimination against workers, the higher rate of capital gains tax on residential property uh, disposals has now been cut from 28% to 24%. A tax break uh, for multiple property owners like the Chancellor himself. Recipients of capital gains do not pay any national insurance, even though they use the NHS and social care. Tens of billions of pounds can be raised by simply aligning the, capital, the taxation of capital gains with the taxation of wages, but the government does not want to upset its uh, rich friends. Since 2010, local council funding has been cut by 23.3% in real terms. Between 2010 and 2023, councils have sold 75,000 public assets for £15 billion to maintain some semblance of public services. Assets such as town halls, libraries, playgrounds, community and youth centres have been sold and now are lost forever to future generations. This has enabled the government to privatise numerous services by stealth, but young people now roam the streets and have nowhere to go. Can the minister provide an estimate of the damage done to the community building by its cuts to council funding? The government has raised the VAT registration threshold, but actually nothing has been done to simplify the anarchic VAT rules, which are forcing many uh, retailers to simply shut the shop. Here are some examples. I hope the Minister will take some note. Toilet rolls are subject to 20% VAT, but caviar, which is a luxury, is zero rated. Potato crisps have 20% VAT, but prawn crackers and tortilla chips are zero rated. Cakes and biscuits are zero rated, but if they are wholly or partly covered in chocolate, they become subject to 20% VAT. I don't know what partly means here. <laughs> there is 0% VAT on unshelled nuts, but 20% VAT is levied on shelled nuts, with the exception of peanuts, even when they are out of their shells. <laughs> Roasted nuts in shells are zero rated for VAT, but if the shell is removed from the roasted nuts or they are salted, then they become standard rated for VAT. But if the nuts are toasted, then they are free from VAT altogether. <laughs> so can the Minister explain to the House what the principles are here and why after 14 years in office the Government has failed to simplify the VAT rules which will reduce administration costs for the retailers by millions of pounds. Overall, this budget will do absolutely nothing to chart a course for the future uh, which we, we should be proud to pass on to our generations. It is simply carrying on with the same misery as for the last 14 years. My Lords, like many others, I saw some encouraging measures to address investment in Britain in the Chancellor of the Exchequer's spring budget. There is, after all, a widely recognized view that Britain needs much more investment in order to power its economic growth plans. In this debate, I would like to reflect on what more needs to be done to make the UK an attractive destination in the eyes of investors, noting that a burden of regulation and bureaucracy is not an attractive elixir. My comments today are influenced by my roles as a corporate board member and as a member of the Oxford University Endowment Investment Committee, as I have disclosed in my register of interests. My Lords, we are all familiar with the prevailing narrative of the UK's anemic economic growth. Although Britain's GDP doubled in the generation from 1995 to 2020, with economic growth averaging 3% per year, the outlook for the years ahead is weak. Specifically, UK economic growth is not expected to exceed 2% between now and 2028, according to the IMF. 
Meanwhile, the government's policy levers are hampered by high public debt and deficits, notwithstanding the constructive trend line that has been already mentioned earlier on. At the end of September 2023, for example, UK government debt was 100% of GDP, compared to less than 40% of GDP 20 years ago. And of course, the economy remains plagued by a cost of living crisis with inflation remaining stubbornly at 4%, twice as much as targeted by the Bank of England. Again, things that we are very familiar with. The economy is further constrained by interest rates at five and a quarter percent. However, it is not only the UK's macroeconomic picture that is challenged, but also the UK's investment landscape. Put simply, Britain is not attracting sufficient capital from investors, retail, institutional, domestic or international, to keep the UK's companies and capital markets as strong as they should be in order to propel economic growth. As the Chancellor himself has acknowledged, domestic share ownership by institutional investors, such as UK pension funds, is worryingly low having fallen from 32% in 1992 to a record low of 1.6% in 2022. I might just say very quickly that as someone who grew up in the emerging markets, people always said, before you invest, think about what the locals are doing. And so the fact that even British UK pension funds will not invest in this economy, for whatever the reasons, is an incredibly damning sign for this economy. Furthermore, just 23 initial public offerings took place on the London Stock Exchange in 2023. It is the lowest since 1995. Think about that for a moment. We've had a pandemic. We've had a financial crisis. And last year, it was worse in terms of IPOs than any of those periods. International investment flows are also bleak. For example, foreign direct investment into the United Kingdom was just 1.4% of GDP in 2022, according to the World Bank. This contrasts with the period of 1995 until the 2008 global financial crisis when UK foreign direct investment was regularly 5% or more of GDP. According to a recent study, UK equities have been trading at a 40% discount to stocks from the rest of the world, underscoring the lack of appetite from investors for investing in the UK. My Lord, it is critical that UK companies can once again be at the forefront of investors' minds when they are allocating capital, and that the stock market becomes attractive to companies seeking listings. I welcome the Chancellor's new measures to channel more investment to UK equities and to introduce a new UK ISA to support savers. This does have the potential to attract up to £4 billion a year of investment capital from retail investors. I am also aware that the Chancellor has previously laid out commitments to attract higher levels of pension fund capital to unlisted UK companies, particularly in his Mansion House speech. Some have raised the question of whether it is right to compel investors to allocate capital to UK equities, or if in fact it is better to incentivize them. With this question in mind, and recognizing my noble friend's um, comments earlier, the Baroness Minister, um, around full expense leasing, small business support, and VAT threshold changes, with these things in mind, I would like the minister to state specific plans. What are the specific plans that this government has to address the UK's underperformance in attracting investment? And what specific plans does the government have to incentivize institutional investors, both domestic and international, to allocate more capital to the UK equity markets and UK companies? <coughs> My Lords, uh, in introducing this debate and bill, the noble lady the Minister spoke several times, I think, about a long-term plan. In the current political climate, that might be taken as a definition of optimism. Yet, perhaps the noble lady is actually right. What we're talking about today is a long-term plan. 
because what we have heard and we expect to hear today from the Labor benches in front of me is that they are broadly planning to follow the Tory economic plan. They're going to allow the rich to keep getting richer, to keep their ill-gotten gains, as my noble lady, uh, noble friend Baroness Jones of Moorscombe so clearly and passionately set out. Um, things that the Labor Party has said it's going to follow the government in. It's pledged that the Labor Party will not introduce a wealth tax if it forms the government. So it's not going to see the broader shoulders bearing their fair share of the weight of repairing so many things that need to be repaired, as so many noble lords have said. Uh, the Labor um, Party has said it's not going to address the issues raised by the noble lord, Lord McPherson of Earl's Court, the inequality of taxation between wages and unearned income, something that simply got worse and worse over the years to the benefit of the rentier class. And Labor has said that it does not um, plan to think about redistribution, but instead, just like the government, it's focused on growth. And it doesn't acknowledge that borrowing to invest is sound economics. I find this frankly astonishing. The most recent Labor comments are that it intends to pay for its plans for the NHS and school breakfasts through savings to public spending. This, um, when, as so many have reflected, the state of our public services, the state of our public infrastructure. Uh, the noble lord to my left on the uh, Lib Dem benches brought up potholes, which is their traditional range, so I'm going to refer to our public services as being like ships that are holed below the waterline. So I've recently been doing a great deal on the NHS, reflecting on its treatment over recent decades as one of the great political failures in the UK. But we've also seen, since Margaret Thatcher, a big and enormous failure of British politics to remember what the economy is for. It's there to serve people, to deliver a decent, healthy and economically as well as environmentally sustainable society. The weekend we had reports talking about from head teachers at schools in the northwest, talking about families that can't afford a bed for their children to sleep in, that can't afford cleaning products for the bathroom. We're talking big macroeconomic stuff, we're, we're talking economic theory, we're talking figures here. We are doing that in a society where children haven't got a bed to sleep in. And the noble Lord Lord Lee was just talking about the, uh, the problems in our uh, financial sector. Um, the Labor Party has pledged to unashamedly champion the UK financial services sector, despite the fact that it's obvious that we have too much finance, an unbalanced economy, and of course we are the global fraud capital. Um, more finance means more fraud. That's a simple fact. Now, I'm afraid even when it comes to the climate emergency, uh, I find now, as opposed to a couple of years ago, considerable similarities between the plans of the Labor Party and the government. Um, the Labor Party had a green investment plan, £28 billion a year spending. You, you might remember that. It's not there anymore. Yet, if we look at a, a recent study from a group of London School of Economics, a um, group of leading economists, uh, said the UK should invest £26 billion a year, very similar to revive prosperity. It said that investment in energy infrastructure, transport and the natural environment would have a rapid boosting effect, with public investment at that level generating double the returns from the private sector. That is the big picture stuff, but what about something that really deserves more attention? Fuel duty. Now, I don't know where the sudden burst of optimism came in the OBR that based its forecasts after the last fiscal event on the assumption that fuel duty would be raised, despite the fact that it hasn't been raised since it was a freeze was introduced as a, a temporary measure in 2011. That and the 5p cut in fuel duty has cost the Treasury £90 billion since 2021. And there's figures just out today pointing out the fact that with the rise in electric cars, 
uh, we're going to actually, the, the prediction is that 2025 will see the absolute level of fuel duty returns to the government fall. This in a situation where uh, in 2011, fuel duty was 4.5 per cent of gross receipts. It's now in 2023 down to 2.4 per cent. All of that for the grand saviour median driver of £13 a month. What could we be doing instead? Well, one of the answers, beyond local buses which desperately need investment, is railways. Now, my noble friend Baroness Jones of I have asked many written questions to the government about railway upgrades that would allow hundreds of thousands of people to get off the roads and onto the rail. Um, a question to the noble lord, the minister not currently in her place. Given there were no announcements in the budget about railways, am I wrong to suggest there will be no significant progress with the Restoring Your Railways Fund and other rail programs before the general election? Practical examples. A rail capacity upgrade at Hawley and Ely Junctions, where Adrian Ramsey and the Suffolk Chamber of Commerce have been calling for progress. The government said it's committed to these upgrades, yet where's the money? Another area worth probing is the Stonehouse Bristol Road Station, which would unlock a direct connection between Stroud and Bristol. The Green Lead Stroud District Council submitted a strategic outline business case in autumn 2022 Yet they've been stonewalled when asking for updates from ministers. They hope to arrive in due course. And I just come to one final very short point, and I declare my position as a vice president of the local government association. The household support fund. It was due to lapse on March 30. 190 council leaders wrote to the government begging for this essential fund to continue for a year so they could plan. What did we get? Better than nothing, but we got six months. So in six months, the councils will have to come back with the begging bowl again. It's not exactly a long-term plan. Economist, as well as a politician, I've always believed that the economy should work for everyone. As a northerner, I'm also keen on levelling up because I am conscious that the rest of the country has fallen behind London and the South East over the last few decades. From that perspective, I thought it was a good budget, and the points were made by my noble friend Baroness Veer with her usual vim and vigour. Despite one slug of money for Canary Wharf, there was a lot going for many, lots of money going for many provincial areas where it is badly needed and will be greatly appreciated. Also, the 2P of national insurance was a sensible help to ordinary people when the economy does need a bit of a stimulus. There was also a 3.4 billion help for improving productivity in the NHS. As a former health minister, I can see where that can be used, though it will also probably be misused in some respects. As we know, public sector productivity is a big problem. Raising some money by abolishing the current regime for non-DOMs was fair. I've always thought that non-DOM arrangement was both antiquated and indefensible. The government can also take credit for the heavy lifting on taxation, which it has which it's put in over the last few years. The general level of tax was needed to be raised and a pragmatic Conservative government has done what is necessary. That is conservatism at its, best, at its best, realistic and responsible. The level of tax is high by UK standards, but still a lot lower than our European neighbours. So in the short term, the budget gains high marks. But if you look a longer, take the longer term perspective, I'm afraid some of the remarks made by the Lord Eatwell cannot be ignored. On nominal GDP, gross domestic product, we are the sixth richest nation in the world. But if, if you look at GDP per capita, we drop down to 21st. And if you measure GDP per capita by purchasing power parity, we drop even further down to 27th. The Taiwanese and the Singaporeans are now richer than the Brits, and the South Koreans have caught up. 
In Europe, we are the second richest nation after Germany on nominal GDP, but 12th on GDP per capita. Mm. If you combine that with the huge increase in inequality, which has developed over the last few decades, you can see why many citizens in the provinces are pretty disenchanted with politics and politicians. Just look at the result of the Rochdale by-election. That will tell you a great deal about ordinary people's view of politics and politicians. What can we do about this? The first thing to do is to get the framework for policy right. Only if you get the framework right, right, will you get the right policies. And the first thing I would do is to abolish the Office of Budget Responsibility. This was put in place to assure the markets that the government was being responsible. But it's now become a problem in itself. As Martin Sanbu said in the Financial Times, it encourages opaque and erratic political gains and undermines serious debate about what the economy really needs. It also, as my noble friend Lord Lee pointed out just now, gets its forecasts quite often wrong. I would replace it with something like the Council of Economic Advisers, which helps the US president. This should be staffed by business people and economists with a remit to enhance economic growth. Positioned like the OBR, it should be able to nudge the Treasury away from forever balancing the books in a candle-ends candle -ends sort of way to taking a more growth-oriented view. I do believe the markets would respond well to a government that obviously was doing sensible things rather than tying itself to the Procrustean bed of the OBR. I do, incidentally, think we should only have one budget every year. Lord Hammond tried to do that but got swept away by the politics. Having more than one budget every year reinforces uncertainty and often produces under-examined tax changes and too many short-term spending decisions. We also need a worked-through industrial strategy. Alongside the macro view of the Council of Economic Advisers, this should be looking at the micro view of the growth, where, where growth can be best assisted by public support. Greg Clark was quite right about that when he was the Minister for, responsible for Business Affairs. Kwasi Kwarteng, Kwarteng was quite wrong. We also need more urgent action on skills. This has been said often enough, but we still haven't given it the priority and financial support required. The apprenticeship level is not working well enough, and we still do not fund further education as well as we, as well as we could. Finally, we do, we do need something about, to do something about the large number of our fellow citizens who are not working, 9.3 million who are not in work. The problem has been made worse by COVID, and it needs urgent analysis, as Lord Lamont pointed out. The fact is that Britain is a great place to do business, as I know from personal experience, having helped to establish a very successful company. But the fact is we are not uh, fulfilling our potential, and we will not do so, despite this excellent short-term budget, until we have a firmer and clearer and more co comprehensive long-term strategy. Yeah. Yeah. My Lords, uh, can I to congratulate uh, the Noble Lord, Lord Council, on an excellent uh, maiden speech, uh, thoughtful uh, and brief, and as we all know, concision is next to godliness. Um, I, I've learned a lot in this uh, debate, including the operation of the VAT regime on nuts, um, probably more than I would have wanted to have known, but uh, I won't concentrate my remarks on that. Uh, I do want to uh, say that it's clear that the Chancellor had a very difficult task in producing the budget, as has been observed by one of his predecessors, the noble Lord, Lord Lamont, who knows better than anyone. And I want to pay tribute to the many good things in the budget. The continuation of the Household Support Fund, the reform of non-DOM status, the increase in public services spending at 1% above inflation, and the welcome reduction in national insurance, to name but a few. I was, though, very disappointed by one lacuna, and it's on that that I want to address, my, to which I want to address my remarks now, that the aid budget was not increased. 
The government has consistently maintained that it would restore the UK's aid budget to 0.7% of GNI when fiscal circumstances allow. And I believe that I speak for very many in expressing dismay that the Chancellor didn't use any of his fiscal headroom to do so, thus restoring a manifesto commitment. The dismay is felt because of the impact of the cuts which have been set out by the Independent Commission for Aid Impact. It noted that cuts have led to less focus on poverty reduction in trade programmes and that programmes focused on gender equality in places where this is much needed have been heavily impacted. The starkest impact of the cuts has been on least developed countries. The amounts of bilateral overseas aid going to least developed countries dropped by £961 million in 2021. That's 40%. That's far greater than those to lower and middle class countries, which received a cut of 339 or 29%, and upper middle income countries, which saw reductions of £117 million or 17%. Of the 10 countries that received the biggest cuts, six were lowest income countries. This is surely a heartbreaking way to prioritise overseas aid spending. And as if the cuts weren't bad enough, we now know that they were focused on countries least able to respond to or mitigate a reduction in funding. If it won't restore a manifesto commitment when fiscal circumstances allow, which surely must be now, I'm not sure what the government has in mind. The White Paper on Development had some good themes and ideas, but without a funding boost, it's extremely difficult to see how Britain can be re-established as a world, leading, a world leader with a great reputation for development because that reputation has been severely damaged of late. The White Paper also doesn't promise any primary legislation, which left many in the development sector wondering what its purpose was. 0.7% of GNP is not just about the actions we take, but the aspirations we set ourselves and our reputation for sticking to our commitments. 0.7% was and remains symbolic of our values and our commitments to some of the poorest people on the planet. We do them and our international reputation a disservice by continuing to ba break a basic promise in this way. My contribution to this debate will be from the perspective of my role as Chair of the Environment and Climate Change Committee. And to ask the question, do the measures in the spring budget demonstrate that this government accepts the need for action today if we are to avert far greater costs tomorrow, both to mitigate against climate change and to put in place measures to reduce its impact? Just yesterday, I received in my inbox the FT Climate Capital newsletter. It is titled, Are We the Boiling Frog? <laughs> Let me quote the opening paragraph. Since March 2023, oceans have begun to warm to previously unseen levels, and now we've hit 365 days of consecutive daily highs. Every day <coughs> of the past 12 months has set a global record. Let that sink in. The global average sea surface temperature tipped to the 21.2 centigrade record this week. And while the cyclical El Nino warming effect of the Pacific Ocean is starting to show signs of weakening, global ocean temperatures remain unusually high. Close quotes. Jim Skier, chair of the UN body of scientists known as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, said recently, that the rise in the average global temperature over the past year meant the world was in unknown territory. My Lords, just as new heat records are reached, it is ironic that companies are taking a step back in terms of corporate accountability for global warming. The FT Lex column 
a few days ago on 15th of March said that corporate backsliding can't be justified. Companies, however, argue that governments have not created the policy frameworks needed to achieve the emissions reductions. Do they have a point? Well, judging by the lack of ambition on green matters demonstrated by this budget, I would say yes, they do have a point. Given the incontrovertible real-life data, not modelled forecasts <coughs> on, on ocean warming, to take just one key indicator of global warming, one would have thought that the opportunity presented by the, by the budget would work to deliver a financial environment that would grab the challenge of transforming our economy to make it fit for purpose to meet our statutory green commitments. Why was this not the case? Because economically it makes sense. And I say this because the UK has already demonstrated that growth and decarbonisation can go hand in hand. We have reduced our greenhouse gas emissions by nearly half since 1990, while GDP has increased by around 70%. More recent analysis by ECIU, Energy and Climate Change Intelligence Unit, and CBI Economics found the net zero economy saw 9% growth in 2023, and the economic opportunities created by the net zero economy are benefiting all UK regions, and net zero jobs are also more productive. One point, around 1.6 times higher than the UK average. The latest Climate Change Committee progress report warns game-changing interventions from the US and Europe are leaving the UK behind. Global investment in clean energy alone is estimated to have risen to $1.7 trillion in 2023. <coughs> The government's announced increase in the green industry's growth accelerator of £120 million, taking the total to £1.1 billion, is just not in the same ballpark. A report by UK SIF, UK Sustainable Investment and Finance Association, found 87% of businesses agree that policy changes to planning rules, grid capacity and energy price mechanisms could unlock £115 billion of investment and allow the UK to compete globally for green investment. And let's not forget the risk of not protecting our natural capital. The government's third, the government's third national adaptation programme outlined that without early action, to adapt to physical climate risks, the costs to England's economy could be between 1 to 1.5% 1 of GDP per annum by 2045. And however, acting now to adapt to climate impacts could deliver up to £10 in net economic benefit for every pound invested. This budget, my Lords, is a missed opportunity to lay the framework needed to invest in our future. The tax system is an important tool alongside clear policy, regulation and spending for supporting the transition to a low carbon and nature positive economy. And in conclusion, my Lords, I'd like to put three questions to the Minister, to the noble lady, the Minister. Uh, firstly, will the government reconsider producing a tax roadmap to make it clear to business and consumers that the fiscal trajectory supports net zero and to allow an adjustment period for where there will likely be greater tax costs? Secondly, how does the government measure and evaluate the effect that taxes have on its environmental objectives? And thirdly, in the Net Zero Growth Plan for March 2023, the government said, and I quote, HMRC will explore options to further strengthen the analytical approach to monitoring, evaluating and quantifying 
the environmental impacts of tax measures, including their wider, implica uh, their wider impacts. Close quote. Can the noble lady, the minister, provide an update on this commitment? My Lords, I will start by highlighting some positive decisions in the 2024 budget. The 2% cut in national insurance NI was good. I also welcome the cut in capital gains tax. The increase in the limits for full and partial child benefits are also most welcome, and the fuel duty freeze continuation is sensible. The introduction of the £5,000 annual ISA for UK shares is innovative, and the new tax on vaping products has health benefits as well as being a pragmatic measure. I feel that the increase of the VAT threshold for small businesses is also a good move. On the broader economy, the fall in inflation back towards its 2% target can be considered useful progress. That's the good news. However, like my noble friend Baroness Noakes, overall I found the budget a big disappointment. With the party being 20% behind in the opinion polls, it needed something much more to change the public mood towards the government. And opinion polls since the budget have showed no change in this position. On the broader economic front, growth forecasts are disappointing. It's interesting to note that the OBR is much more optimistic than the Bank of England and slightly more than the independent forecasters surveyed in February. It is very worrying that the OBR reports that 2022-23 remains a fiscal year with the largest year-on-year -year drop in living standards since ONS records began in the 1950s. Looking in more detail at government income, I find it depressing that the tax take from business rates is forecast to increase by 33% in the next five years, a huge extra burden on already struggling businesses. But when you see that items like welfare expenditure are forecast to rise by 38% and funded sector public pension schemes by 25%, it can be seen that the revenue is needed. However, business rates need reform to make sure the larger out-of-town warehouses pay a fairer share and smaller ones aren't clobbered. Further on the government receipt side, the figures disprove the fact that overall taxes are being reduced for the individual. Of course this is the case with national insurance reductions, but the freezing of tax allowances over the next five years much more than cancels out the NI reduction. OBR figures show that the extra tax due in this period, due to this fiscal drag, amounts to 187 billion, which is only offset by the NI reductions to the extent of 105 billion. Hence, the taxpayers are on the hook for an extra amount of 81 billion. With regard to central government debt interests, this merely stabilises a still worrying annual 110 billion in 2028-29, as against 111 billion in the last tax year. On the government expenditure side, I note that according to the OBR, the net cost of unwinding quantitative easing to the taxpayer, assuming interest rates remain the same as now, is forecast at 104 billion. If gilt yields go up by 1%, the OBR says this increases to 157 billion, and if 1% down, to only 47 billion, a worrying extra black hole for the taxpayer. This is a huge incentive for any government to keep inflation back under control so that interest rates may re be reduced. Turning to individual tax measures, I cannot see the sense in getting rid of the non-domicile status. The move was done, in my view, as a political one to outsmart the proposed Labour declared policy without fully thinking through the economic consequences. The forecast of extra tax gained is highly optimistic, as these non-DOMs can easily <coughs> move to countries like Italy and Portugal, who offer attractive regimes for them. Also, the UK loses the benefits of these non-DOMs running businesses and employing people, as well as VAT on their spending on goods and services. So overall, does not the Minister believe that the UK is likely to lose tax revenue by this move? 
Secondly, I believe the government missed a huge opportunity through timidity in not changing inheritance tax. As a respected political commentator, Andrew Pearce, pointed out recently, when George Osborne announced in 2007 that the limit before IHT is due was to rise to 1 million, the Labour lead in the opinion polls collapsed, and it stopped Gordon Brown calling a general election. Despite advice from Conservative peers and others, the Chancellor brushed the idea aside, as I understand, feeling it was too elitist a measure. I think he underestimates the overall popularity it might have gained, as evidenced by Osborne's 2007 decision. Could I ask the Noble Lord the Minister to comment? The next disappointment was the failure to reinstate tax-free shopping, TFS, for foreign visitors. In November 2020, the OBR forecast that the abolition would generate a 1.8 billion saving to the Treasury, whilst adding the caveat the figures are highly uncertain. Why could not the Chancellors have continued the scheme to clarify this uncertainty? A key challenge for the OBR analysis, highlighted by economic forecasters like Oxford Economics, is that their research did not examine the impact of TFS schemes on retail expenditure and its broad multiplier effects. For instance, increased economic activity in other sectors beyond retail, such as tourism and more job retention and creation. Oxford Economics' modelling of the decision's impact suggests that the reintroduction of duty-free shopping will have a significant positive effect in terms of GDP, tax yield and job creation. And it's not just economic forecasting organisations supporting this reinstatement. In August 2023, the Mail on Sunday stated that 350 retailers have backed his campaign. I think this is now up to 500, along with 40 Conservative MPs. Could the noble lady, the Minister, answer as to why it should not be reintroduced, even on an experimental basis? If I am asked how these um, tax changes should be financed, how about looking at the welfare budget, which is forecast to increase by nearly 40%, over the next five years. So, my Lords, whilst the Labour Party would likely have produced no better tax measures, this budget was a chance to put blue water between the political parties. Sadly, after careful review, I feel the Chancellor has missed a huge opportunity to demonstrate we are a low-tax party. <coughs> we seem to have forgotten this, as now, despite the NI cuts, we are most highly taxed since the Second World War. My Lords, um in his great novel, Anna Karenina, Tolstoy remarked that while happy families are all alike, every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Well, how true that is of the situation in Europe today, whether one looks at the Netherlands or Germany or France or Sweden, one sees uh, governments and society coping with severe problems, economic and social, that are very similar to our own. And I make that point because I think there is a tendency in this country, uh, and it's been reflected indeed during the course of this debate, to assume that the problems which, with which we are confronted are somehow uh, unique to us uh, and the result of very particular British circumstances. And that's why I think my noble friend uh, Lord Lamont and my noble friend Baroness Lawler and the noble Lord Lord Macpherson were all quite right in drawing attention to the fact that in a variety of different areas uh, the British economy has outperformed uh, forecasts and has performed better uh, against uh, other countries than many people suppose. I, I agree very much with the, the points that they made and I, I won't repeat them. Now, in the short time available to me and at the end of a long debate, I had intended to make only three points. But before I make those three points, I would like to refer to something which my noble friend, <coughs> my noble friend Lord Horham, uh, said uh, when he was talking about GDP per head and GDP itself, and he linked uh, what he was saying to the very considerable rise in 
inequality in this country and the effect uh, that that has had on attitudes, uh, on people's attitudes to their own position as well as to the, as, as well as their attitudes uh, to politics in general. Now, my, uh, to turn to my three points, the first point I want to make is to congratulate the government on shifting the balance of benefits in favour of those of working age and away from pensioners. Pensioners have done uh, very well in, in recent years, as I and many other members of this House know to their, know from their own experience. But there is a great need, as my noble friend Lord Lamont said, to encourage more people back into work, um, a great need to do that, and certainly making work pay is an important part of doing that. Car uh, it's an important carrot, sticks are needed as well, but it is a very desirable, a very desirable event, a very desirable policy change to, to promote work in this way. An additional advantage of that, of course, too, is that if we could encourage more people back to work, we would have less need of immigration in order to fill uh, so many of our public services, especially the NHS. My second point is also to congratulate the government, and on this point I want to congratulate it on the 3.4 million uh, that has gone to the NHS, specifically for improving productivity. I spent some years as chairman of Imperial College, the Imperial College uh, Healthcare NHS Trust, and I can see from my own experience, although that was now some time ago, how important this initiative by the Chancellor is. It, the effects really could be dramatic by digitising operating theatre processes, the same number of consultants could do an extra 20,000 operations a year. This is exactly the sort of initiative the NHS needs, and it provides a precedent for other public services. My third point, having praised the government on two points, my third point is, I'm afraid, to uh, criticise. In the defence debate last September, I called for a start to be made in increasing defence expenditure. Since then, the world has become a good deal more dangerous as uh, a result of events in the <coughs> Middle East. In its rhetoric, the government recognises the change that has taken place, and it also continues, quite rightly, to send considerable quantities of military equipment uh, to Ukraine. It's quite right to do that, but the effect, of course, is to deny our own forces that equipment, and it's going to take a long time to fill the gaps. Now, the government talks a great deal in other circumstances about the increased dangers in the world, but it is not putting its money where its mouth is. An ambition to increase defence spending to 2.5% when economic circumstances permit, is all very well. But unfortunately, the dangers to this country don't follow the same, uh, the same uh, uh, rhythm as our economic circumstances. And I do regret that the government didn't take advantage of this budget to take a first step towards increasing our, our, our defence expenditure. The fact that the Secretary of State for Defence can't even fly anywhere near uh, the, the Russian border because his aeroplane doesn't have the right kind of equipment to uh, prevent uh, the Russians from interfering with it is a, one example of, of the situation we're in. The embarrassments that have been caused by our aircraft carrier is a, are another. So I do very much regret that the government didn't take a first step, and I hope that the, uh, my noble friend, the Minister, will be able to say something about that in her wind-up.
It's, um, it's a great pleasure to follow my noble friend, Lord Tuggenhart, and I want to echo many of the remarks made by um, other uh, me members of the House, Lord Lamont, a former Chancellor of the Exchequer, Lord McPherson, <coughs> a former Head of the Treasury, and many others, in being very optimistic at the start of my speech. Um, the economy, which was so badly hit by the pandemic, by the war in Ukraine, and so on, is now beginning to show signs of recovery. Um, in inflation is falling, <clears throat> interest rates too look set to fall, and the prospects for growth are good. And there has been a positive reaction to the budget. I have some figures here, quite interesting figures, which show popular reaction to various proposals. And the approval ratings range from 56%, 63%, 76%, 81%. And I can only hope that it won't be long before these figures are reflected in more important opinion polls in the country. Uh, so there was an optimistic theme running through the Chancellor's speech. And it was the same in the published uh, budget report, the Red Book. Although all 36 paragraphs of the executive summary had so upbeat a theme that they, they were almost panglossian, um, the best of all possible worlds. However, I was struck by one other thing in the budget report, and that is that the text was not in black, it was in light grey, making it slightly more difficult to read. And I th it was as if the Treasury was trying to tell us, well, it isn't all black and white. The pale grey is sending a subliminal message that what we, the Treasury, say is nuanced with cautious subtexts. So let me take one example, <clears throat> and that is government borrowing. Uh, the Chancellor in his speech, and indeed my noble friend the Minister in her speech this afternoon, talked about national debt and falling national debt. Uh, and it's forecast to fall every year from now to the year 2028-29. Now that, of course, is national debt, not the annual deficit. But what determines the national debt is the deficit or surplus, if we ever get back to those days. And the deficit depends on two variables revenue coming into the government and spending by the government. And both of these are highly variable. Public spending depends on many, many events outside the control of government. We've seen already, as I've said, the pandemic, the war in Ukraine, uh, and the oil and energy crisis. And on the home front, much of the public spending is also outside government control. Here's something which I think everybody knows in the House, but let me just read what the OBR says, which should worry us all. The number of inactive working age adults is 9.3 million, 700,000 more than before the pandemic. And the OBR goes on. Around one third of the working age inactive population cite long-term illness as their principal reason for not to being in the labour force. This should set alarm bells in ri ringing, not just about the cost of the public purse, but about the nature and causes of these illnesses and the economic loss to the country. This requires serious analysis because ultimately it is unsustainable. So for these reasons and many others, the forecasts of public spending and, uh, and borrowing are bound to become ever more speculative with every future year, which is why we need a contingency reserve, a substantial contingency reserve. This year, I see it's a forecast to be 9.2 billion. Is this enough? Is it based on the recent experiences of all the crises we've had? And even without the predicted uh, pressure on um, predicted uh, uh, pressures on uh, on public spending, they're going to be increasing further demands. 
on the health service, on, as my noble friend has said, on defence. And looming ahead, there is one other horror, if there were a Labour government, and that is the rolling back of the trade union reforms brought in by previous Conservative governments, which were broadly accepted by the Blair-Brown governments, and, but which would be repealed by a Starmer government. And I just wonder whether the noble Lord, Lord Livermore, who served in, uh, in number 10 during uh, the time when Gordon Brown was Prime Minister, whether he um, is a wholehearted supporter of his party's proposals to ditch these trade union reforms. Finally, and quite separately, can I make two very simple pleas to the Treasury? First, despite the voluminous information published in the OBR report and in the Chancellor's own budget report, or perhaps because of it, it's sometimes really difficult to find the most basic information. Hardly anywhere is there a table setting out clearly side by side government revenue and government spending. The nearest you get to it are the two pie charts stuck away in an appendix on the very last two pages of the budget report, pages 93 and 94. We need more of a plain man's guide to help the general public understand the basic realities. And my second plea is this, and I echo here what my noble friend Lord Horham said. It may just be me, but I'm losing track of budget statements, autumn statements, spring statements. Again, this seems to make it more difficult for lesser mortals to understand the relationship between public spending and taxation. So, surely it's possible to have just one budget statement a year setting out public expenditure, tax rates and government borrowing. My Lords, as the first of the winding speakers, may I start with three very quick quick comments to uh, Lord Kempsell, who's racing to get back into his place. May I say what an excellent maiden speech, but his tastes for the nitty-gritty in evaluation and analysis, I suggest, means that he's in the right house and the right portfolio, so we will look forward to his engagement in the future. To my colleague, Lord Lee, that uh, the proposal that he had that some of the NatWest shares currently in public hands should be shared with secondary schools as part of inspiring <coughs> financial education and creating a new way of looking for so many of our young children. It's a brilliant idea, and I hope very much the government will take that up. And to Lord Bird, who made those comments on social housing, in effect, that social housing should be a launch pad and not a trap, I thought that was a really important piece of discussion in this debate today. But my Lords, um, there's, uh, I perhaps I should uh, say I'm sorry to Lord Sherbourne because of his most recent comments, but most normal people have already forgotten what's in this budget. The Chancellor's headline measure, a reduction in the rate of the national insurance contribution, has been dismissed as people realise that it's just a reduction in a relentless tax rise driven by the freezing of thresholds. Indeed, and I'll quote the OBR, tax as a share of GDP is forecast to rise to 37.1% of GDP in 2028-29, 4% of GDP higher than pre-pandemic level. And meanwhile, the public borrowing will increase by on average £8 billion a year, I quote from that same source, Frankly, it's leaving us in a fiscal vice. The IFS, uh, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, describes living standards as remaining dismal. I pick up on Lord Horam's uh, excellent discussion, others mentioned it, but talking about GDP per capita and by comparison with other countries. It's a woeful position to be in at this moment in time. That, uh, and according to the Resolution Foundation, looking at a narrower group, pensioners, that, uh, they now forecast that they will on average be £1,000 worse off a year by 2027-28. 
Now, my Lords, my party will not oppose the national insurance rate cut, given the ongoing struggle of so many people with the cost of living. But the focus for the Liberal Democrats remains the dire state of the NHS and the missed opportunity in this budget to provide it with the resources needed. You know, closing loopholes in the oil and gas tax windfall tax, if you remember it was extended, but the investment loophole through which everybody storms had been left wide open. <coughs> a tax on share buybacks. Most of us wish to see investment, not share buybacks, as the, uh, the, uh, 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 which have become increasingly popular. Restoring the levy on the banks, which frankly have been raking it in thanks to high interest rates, which they then don't pass on to savers. And all of those kinds of sources could have helped us make a real difference on resources for the NHS. But we've had two debates around most of these issues in the course of February, and I don't want to rehash all the things that I said then. I'm sure most people are tired of them. What I want to do is look forward, and I do so with a certain real anxiety for what faces the UK. And I want to understand what this Conservative government plans for public services and for local government, recognising the dire state that most are in. We have a few pieces of information. The government has instructed the OBR that real departmental spending on public services will fall by 1% of GDP over the next five years. According to the IFS, this means a fall in the public capital and infrastructure spending of £18 billion a year in real terms, and a fall in day-to-day -day departmental spending for the unprotected departments, again in real terms, by £20 billion a year. Now, that number is absolutely huge. I pick up Baroness Lister's concerns over local authority cuts. That, uh, um, uh, uh, it, the, the government, it seems to me, tells us constantly that it has a plan for public services. And what I'm now asking the Minister is, show us that plan. Because when I look for where these public spending cuts are going to be replaced by new public uh, productivity and efficiency, the only thing that I can really see is some vague notion that artificial intelligence or other kinds of digital change will deliver this kind of extraordinary efficiency. And I share the scepticism, I think, of Lord Lamont that uh, on uh, productivity improvements coming so easily. And Lord McPherson told us how he'd seen many an efficiency plan come and then go. So I say to the government, tell us the plan and tell us in <coughs> detail so we can judge how credible that crushing reduction in expenditure and investment into public services is going to look. My Lords, we also have a promise from the Chancellor that national insurance will be abolished. It's not in the budget, but in effect it accompanied it. Now that step removes £46 billion a year in revenue from the Exchequer. And I would do ask the uh, Minister, will she tell us? Does that mean huge new borrowing? Is it going to be 7p on the basic rate of income tax? Is it going to be a decimation again of public services, and if so, which and when? £46 billion is virtually the whole school's budget, or justice and defence put together. We need to understand where that money to replace that national insurance abolition will come from. Now, once innocently, I thought that the government's freezing of tax thresholds was a temporary emergency measure. But it's now, I think, becoming clear to all of us that using threshold freezing to bring the lowest earners into tax is actually a key part of the Conservative plan. I remember the days of coalition. Lifting tax thresholds to remove tax from lower earners was a central Liberal Democrat policy. And many on the Conservative benches, and I see some here and know who you are, were furious with us in the Liberal Democrats for forcing it on the coalition because they felt very strongly that tax cuts should go to top earners and not to people down at the bottom. But it now seems to me this is actually the Conservative plan to return to a focus on low-income people <coughs> as a major source of new tax 
revenue. Indeed, it's well underway. We've seen the freezing of the thresholds, and it carries on now for further years. So perhaps the Minister will openly confirm the change of direction, lower earners to pay more and more tax. Let me end by turning to the vital issue of economic growth. The OBR is more optimistic than other forecasters, but even it sees only the most anemic growth, and I pick up the comments here of Baroness Moyo as well. 0.8% this year, rising to 2% in the middle of the decade. And that estimate depends on higher than previously anticipated immigration. UK businesses are desperate for skills. Where is there anywhere in this budget or in policy a proper reform of the apprenticeship levy? The government took some useful steps, announced them today, but it's not the fundamental <coughs> overhaul that is absolutely needed to drive up the quality of skills in this country. The post-Brexit fall in trade intensity, initially forecast at 15%, now looks as though the actual actuality is significantly worse. Our trade and services is strong, but the UK's growth in goods trade is well below expectations and well behind the rest of the G7. And that, in turn, has a huge impact on productivity. So where is the trade plan that means reviving our trade with Europe? And let's not pretend that the new trade deals, though they're much vaunted, are more than, frankly, a rounding adjustment with some modest potential. Where are the mechanisms to seriously raise investment in UK businesses and infrastructure? And many in this debate, Baroness Moy perhaps most particularly, focused on that issue. But in a sense, it was a subject of the speech by my colleague Baroness Bowles, focusing on investment trusts, an absolutely key vehicle that is disappearing because of slow government action. That's a, where are these mechanisms to help us increase that investment? The new British ISA, the Edinburgh reforms, they're useful, but let's be frank, neither of them is a game changer. The government today seems to have made some useful changes on the definition of SMEs, but could the minister please tell us what the scope is of that and what the implications are, and she can write if she doesn't have it to hand. But behind this scattering of limited changes, there is no long-term policy certainty and no meaningful commitment to priorities. Every policy is unstable, and that includes tackling the major crises that my colleague Baroness Sheehan focused on, that of climate change. The number one request from businesses, according to research by the Business Magazine, is, and I quote, a clear and concise industrial strategy. Will the minister please tell us why we don't have one? We have a workforce shortage, made far worse by the NHS waiting list, 2.7 million people. Others have talked about the huge number of those, 9 million who are of working age but inactive. That, uh, the economically inactive range across the young as well as the old. That, uh, as Lord Sherborne said, most of them, or a very good number of them, that uh, are, are inactive because of long-term sickness, a third of them, that uh, few measures would drive our economy forward more rapidly than fixing the NHS, which is the mechanism to get so much of our inactive population back to work. Andy Haldane, the former uh, uh, chief economist of the Bank of England, described these budget measures as macroeconomic marginalia. And I thought that was a brilliant description. I suspect most of your lordships actually agree. And I say to the minister, this is not a budget that meets the needs of our times. My lords, it is a privilege to take part in this debate on both the spring budget and the National Insurance Contributions Bill and to be able to listen to and learn from contributions from so many genuinely expert noble lords. May I join others in congratulating the noble lord, Lord Kempsell, on his excellent maiden speech, bringing his valuable first-hand experience of policymaking to your lordship's house, and I look forward to his further contributions in the future. The budget was delivered against the backdrop of an economy that had fallen into recession. 
Its context was an economy that is now smaller than when the current Prime Minister took office, and it revealed forecasts for an economy that, rather than bouncing back, will do little more than bump along the bottom this year. In his budget statement, the Chancellor set out his own definition of economic success, the yardstick by which he wishes to be judged. He said he wanted not just higher GDP, but higher GDP per head. So how should we judge the government against this measure? In the past year, GDP per head shrank in every single quarter. In fact, the latest ONS figures show it has fallen for seven consecutive quarters. In per capita terms, our economy hasn't grown since the first quarter of 2022. As my noble friend Lord Eatwell observed, that's the longest period of stagnation Britain has seen since 1955. This year, GDP per capita is again set to shrink, not grow. As a result, it will be lower at the end of this year than it was at the start of this Parliament. And in the budget, we learn that forecast GDP per capita growth has been revised down in four of the next five years. Not perhaps the success the Chancellor was looking for. Many noble lords mentioned the comparative performance of the UK economy, including the noble lords Lord Lamont of Lerwick, Baroness Goldie, Baroness Lawler, Lord Tugendhat, and Lord Sherborne of Didsbury. Our country has undoubtedly gone through a difficult time these past few years, and the origins of many of the crises we have faced are, of course, global. Pandemic, war, and the energy crisis. But other countries have also experienced those shocks. And if the UK economy had grown at the average of the OECD since 2010, it would now be £140 billion bigger than it is today. That's equivalent to £5,000 per household every year and would mean an additional £50 billion in tax revenues to invest in our public services. Why have we fared so much worse? Because each time crisis has hit, Britain has found itself acutely exposed due to the choices this government has made over 14 years. The austerity mentioned by the noble lord, Lord Skidelsky, that choked off investment, then Brexit without a plan, and then the disastrous mini-budget, which crashed the economy, sending interest rates soaring to a 15-year high, and saw mortgage payments rise by an average of £220 every month. Yet, having crashed the economy, the government seems not to have learnt the lessons and are now apparently intent on rerunning the disastrous Liz Truss experiment. As my noble friends Baroness Lister of Butterset and Lord Davis of Brixton said, the Chancellor, at the end of his budget statement, and reiterated by the Prime Minister as recently as today, announced a £46 billion unfunded plan to abolish national insurance contributions. But both the Prime Minister and the Chancellor have repeatedly refused to explain how it would be funded. Will it be paid for by yet more tax rises on working people? The Chancellor refused to rule out raising income tax to pay for it when asked to do so at the Treasury Select Committee. Will it be paid for by higher borrowing? Or will it be paid for by cutting spending on vital public services, our schools, hospitals and police? There are also genuine concerns that need to be addressed about pensions. National insurance contributions determine people's entitlement to the basic state pension, as well as other contributory benefits. So if national insurance contributions are scrapped, how will working people know what their future entitlement to the state pension is? If the plan is instead to merge national insurance and income tax, what will this mean for pensioners' tax bills, including the taxes they pay on their savings? The government's previous reckless and unfunded tax plan crushed the economy, and working people are still paying the price. Taxes are still rising, prices are still going up in the shops, and mortgages are still higher. Britain cannot afford to repeat that ill-fated experiment. We support tax cuts for working people, but in order to be sustainable and genuinely make people better off, they must be fully costed and fully funded. This is an irresponsible, unfunded spending commitment without any plan to pay for it, which risks crushing the economy all over again.
And once again, it will be working people who pay the price. Many noble lords focus today on the cuts to national insurance contained in the bill we are also debating, including the noble lords Lord McPherson of Earl's Court, Lord Young of Cookham, Baroness Goldie, Baroness Noakes, Lord Horham and Lord Northbrook. We have been consistent over the course of this Parliament that taxes on working people should be lower. Two years ago, when the current Prime Minister tried to increase national insurance, we opposed it. We supported the last cut to national insurance, and we support the measures announced in the budget contained in this bill to bring it down by a further 2%. Government ministers have previously been rebuked by the chair of the UK Statistics Authority for repeatedly making misleading claims about their record on tax. So let us be clear. These measures come in the context of a rising, not falling, tax burden. The tax burden is now set to rise every single year for the next five years, rising to the highest level in 70 years, making this the biggest tax-raising parliament since the Second World War. While the cuts in national insurance are welcome, they are more than eclipsed by increases in taxes the government has previously announced. Tax thresholds are still frozen, increasing taxes by £41.1 billion over the forecast period, creating, as my noble friend Lord Seeker pointed out, 3.7 million new taxpayers by 2028-29. As a result, for every £10 the government are taking in higher tax, they are giving only £5 back. And by the end of the forecast period, the average family will be £870 worse off. As Paul Johnson, the director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, has said, this remains a parliament of record tax rises. And as the Resolution Foundation have said, this will be the first parliament ever to see living standards fall. My Lords, having spent years defending the indefensible, in the budget the government belatedly performed a welcome U-turn and recognised the importance of closing the non-DOM tax loophole. We have long made the simple, patriotic argument that if people make Britain their home, they should pay their taxes here too. In the Budget, the Office for Budget Responsibility confirmed that the steady state revenue raised by the non-DOM policy is £3 billion per year. So why didn't the Government U-turn sooner? My right honourable friend, the Shadow Chancellor, first called for that loophole to be closed two years ago, meaning we've missed out on £6 billion in tax revenue money that could have been invested in our public services. And if further proof were needed that Labour is winning the battle of ideas, it is the further extension of the time-limited windfall tax on the oil and gas producers. Yet even now, the government has still left gaping loopholes, meaning many energy giants will still pay less in tax. My Lords, we are under no illusion about the scale of the challenge we may inherit, nor the scale of the task of rebuilding our economy and our country. Labour's economic plan will be built on the pillars of stability, investment and reform. Stability guided by strong fiscal rules and robust economic institutions. Investment brought about in partnership with business through a new National Wealth Fund to invest in the industries of the future. Reform of our planning system, the skills system and a genuine living wage. In contrast, the stark reality of this budget is clear. Taxes rising, living standards falling, growth stalling. The harsh reality the government must face is that the damage is done. Nothing they can do now will compensate for the fact that people are worse off. Working people paying more, pensioners paying more, homeowners paying more. The questions people ask ahead of the next general election are simple. Are they and their families better off after 14 years of this government? Do our schools, hospitals, police or transport work better than when this government came to office 14 years ago? Frankly, does anything in our country work better than it did 14 years ago? The answers are always a resounding no. Only Labour can provide the change our country so desperately needs. My Lords, it is a pleasure to close today's debate on the Spring Budget and the second reading of the Nix Bill. As anticipated, uh, it has been a spirited debate uh, with very thoughtful contributions from all of the benches. I'm particularly grateful for the support from, from the Noble Lords on the benches behind me. 
Um, well, some of them, anyway. But I also particularly welcome the contribution from the noble Lord, Lord Kempsell. His maiden speech was, was excellent, I thought, uh, and I appreciate his nerdy-like focus on the evaluation of public spending. There cannot be enough nerds in your Lordship's house. Um, and the evaluation task force of which he spoke uh, has already um, proved very useful in terms of thinking about the evaluation evidence that we use at the heart of all uh, government decisions. Um, it was used during the spring 2021 spending review, um, and I'm sure it will continue to be uh, really key in decision making in the future. Um, I was very much hoping. I was very much hoping that the noble Lord Lord Livermore would respond to the challenge from the noble Baroness Lady Bennett. Uh, to set out how the Labour, I want to call it a plan, but I think that might be stretching it, how the Labour plan is different from the well thought through plans of this Conservative government. I'm sadly it wasn't forthcoming again. Um, the noble Lord Lord Livermore did actually, though, bemoan the fact that um, obviously mortgages are high. I'm not sure he understands why interest rates are high. It's to bring down inflation. Um, and also, he's, he's very concerned about prices going up in the shops. I'm sure he recognises that wholesale prices going down in the shops across the board is actually a very bad thing. Um, but I'll just leave it there. But what I will say is that when the Chancellor stood up to deliver this spring budget. The markets were stable. There was warm words all round, and I think it was the sort of budget that we needed. So, it is worth reflecting first on. on uh, many noble lords have talked about uh, growth, and actually, many noble lords have reflected that um, the performance recently demonstrates that the economy has turned a corner. And I do think that this reflects the decisions that this government has taken. Um, I think that the doldrums narrative, I think some of the words being used by, by the opposition are not quite landing anymore because they don't quite reflect what is going on uh, with reality. So my advice would be to find some slightly uh, different wording um, there. We do know that uh, uh, our economy suffered like other economies, and that my noble friend Lord Tugendhat talked about the similar internal factors and wider externalities that impacted many um, other uh, economies. And we also know that the combined impact of the autumn statement, but also the spring budget, will provide a permanent 0.7% increase in the level of potential output by the end of the forecast. Um, Turning to the, uh, the question of GDP per capita, and of course there are many factors that go into GDP per capita. This government um, is absolutely uh, uh, going to focus on how we can improve our, our GDP per capita, and I will, will come on uh, to that in due course. Um, but I also think that it is important that we look at wider factors as well. Um, for example, uh, real incomes have been growing stronger than expected this year. Real wages are now higher than pre-pandemic levels and have risen for the past uh, seven months. The OBR now expects living standards, as measured by real household disposable income per person, to grow by 0.8% in 23-24 and to continue to grow in all financial years over the forecast horizon. So I hope that the noble Lord Lord Sicker will at least welcome that, if almost nothing else I have to say today. But my noble friend Baroness Lawler did note uh, the impact of migration, and indeed a number of noble lords uh, mentioned this. And, and we are clear that migration must always benefit the UK. The UK has experienced unprecedented levels of migration since the COVID pandemic, which is why we have introduced our five-point plan. Um, but these measures, we, we need to think about the, the, the extent to which we support our, our, our important public services like health, social care and education, but also balance that with ensuring that we attract the best and the brightest, because it is the case that highly skilled migrants do contribute hugely to the UK's tech se sector. 49% of the UK's fastest growing businesses and nine of the UK's 14 unicorns have at least one foreign-born co-founder. Um, so coming back to uh, the issue of, of in increasing the number of people who are contributing to the GDP of our nation, so getting the inactive back to work, and this was raised by my noble friend Lord Lamont and of course my noble friend Lord Tugendhat and the noble Lord, Lords 
Skidelsky, it's really, really important that we encourage these people back to work. And that is why, in the autumn statement in 2023, the government announced a new back to work plan. And this, this is worth over £2.5 billion to expand employment support for the long term sick and disabled. That includes people who have poor mental health and also support for the long, the long term unemployed. This built on a previously announced £7 billion employment package from the spring budget in 2023. My Lords, we recognise there is a problem that needs to be fixed. Um, I recognise that there is probably not one single bullet, but my word, if we can make some inroads in getting those people back into, into meaningful employment, that really will be a game changer. My Lords, very briefly on inflation, I think all noble lords will agree that the work of the Monetary Policy Committee at the Bank of England by keeping interest rates high in order to reduce inflation, which sadly obviously has a knock-on impact on mortgage rates, um, we are very well welcoming of the forecasts that the OBR put out there um, of where we think the inflation is going to be. I listened with interest to the contribution from my noble friend Baroness Lawler, and I will read the recommendations of the um, economic... Uh, I don't know which committee, the Economic Committee, uh, with interest, um, and the Treasury will respond as appropriate. And turning to the point raised by the Noble Lord, Lord Skidelsky, the impact of the disruption on the Red Sea is included in the OBR forecasts. The forecast shows that it's about a 0.2% increase in inflation in the central, uh, the central case. Well, also, I just want to spend a, a brief amount of time uh, just, just going back to this issue of government debt and, and why are we in the situation that we are in, because sometimes... I particularly will, will refer to the, you know, the unprecedented challenges of the COVID pandemic and also you know, the energy crisis spawned out of the war um, in Ukraine. But I think just going back to the pandemic, because obviously I was a minister for the whole of the pandemic and I saw vast quantities of money propping up our economy and our society and our health system and all parts of it. We often talk about the furlough scheme that protected, protected nearly 12 million jobs. That was enormous. But what we sometimes, you know, we, we don't think about is the two billion cult, culture recovery fund that we put in place. Public transport systems, that was my old patch. I think I managed to spend part of the £12.8 billion we put into that. Um, the health service got an extra £81 billion of COVID ring fence funding, £5 billion uh, towards uh, uh, the, the, the academic recovery. So all of this uh, needs to be remembered when, when noble laws will turn around and sort of criticise um, what has had to happen in terms of the forecasts for our tax rates. It has to be repaid. What I may well do the next time I'm closing one of these debates, because I think it might be quite interesting, I will spend some time going through Hansard, and I think my closing will literally just quote various noble lords uh, from the opposition benches all the times when they wanted us to spend even more or shut things down for even longer. And in those two circumstances, my lords, we would be in a much worse situation than we are now. So we did emerge from the pandemic quicker than many other uh, similar nations. Um, but I absolutely accept that it has meant that we've had to make some difficult choices on tax. We have made those choices, and now we are able to make other choices which improves the situation on tax. So, let us be absolutely clear, to quote the noble Lord, Lord Livermore, the cumulative impact of the tax changes over the last four fiscal events reduces the tax burden by 0.6% from what it would otherwise have been. I think that's super clear, completely clear. I absolutely accept that the tax burden is too high, I accept that it, that it is going up. I accept that there are massive underlying reasons why the tax burden is as it is. And I also know that many noble laws opposite would have had us in an in a even worse position had we uh, listened to them. So we've had to take a fair approach to repairing the public finances. It is the case that we've asked everyone to contribute a little more through keeping tax thresholds fixed. It is also the case that if one enters a new tax threshold, one is earning more money. One doesn't get there by accident. 
Um, but of course, uh, and as we know, wages are going up faster than inflation, and so therefore, in real terms, you would be earning more money. Now, we have now decided that the best way to grow the economy whilst ensuring that inflation is kept under control is to reward those in work. And actually, when I first heard this, this issue about, about uh, taxing those uh, people twice on work, I, it took me a little while to, to get it. I was like, oh my goodness, that's absolutely true. I've been in this game for quite a long time and I hadn't really thought about the fact that if you're a worker, you get paid, to, you, you charge tax, you get charged, paid, uh, charged tax twice. So it is right that we make the tax system fairer and simpler and we reward hard work um, in the UK. Um, and I welcome the comments from the noble Lord, Lord McPherson, my noble friend Lord Lamont, that we are right to focus on uh, NICS versus income tax. I tried to follow the noble Lord, Lord Davis, but I think he was calling for a large income tax rise for unearned income, so I, I didn't go down that, that route. But many noble lords have said, oh, this is terrible, this is an unfunded tax court. I'm so sorry. Political parties, governments, all sorts of people state their ambition, state their vision all the time. That is simply what this government is doing. We want to end the unfairness. That means if you get your income from having a job, you pay two types of taxes, NICs and income tax. But if you get it from another source, you only pay one. And so therefore it is perfectly reasonable for us to set out a long-term ambition to abolish employee and self-employed NICs entirely to end this unfairness that sits within the tax system. And it is also perfectly reasonable for us to say that we will not do this overnight. It can only be done in a fiscally responsible way and when it can be achieved without compromising high quality public services. I just don't understand why that is difficult to grasp. Um, the noble Baroness Lady Lister, I absolutely recognise that some people uh, may be concerned that this will have an impact somehow on uh, state pensions or contributory, contributory benefits, and I'd like to reassure her that it does not. <laughs> we believe in the contributory principle. Cutting next does not affect anyone's entitlement to the state pension or contributory benefits, nor does it impact decisions on funding for the NHS. The fact that the money uh, does still go into something called the National Insurance Fund is a little bit of smoke and mirrors because, it, because, it, because as all noble lords know, uh, the, the government or the Treasury retains the ability to top up the National Insurance Fund. So it, it's, it, it, it's not a requirement um, that, uh, that the two have to go hand in hand, that just because you reduce um, employees' national insurance that somehow someone's contributory uh, benefits would change. That's the way it is. Um, the noble Lord, Lord Sicker, I, I very much appreciated the, um, the, 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 the nuts, the taxes on nuts. I, I agree, uh, sometimes it can be a little confusing, but having you know, been in the VAT game uh, myself in the past as a finance director, I do know that actually systems can cope with these sorts of things. VAT has been designed as a broad-based tax on consumption. Um, where there are exceptions to the standard case are often strictly limited to legal and, and fiscal considerations. And it, it's widely viewed as quite an economically efficient and non-distortive way of raising revenues. Um, I very much welcome the insights from the noble Lord, Lord Lee, um, on VAT and VAT evasion. Um, I will take his comments back to the Treasury and to the M M HMRC, and uh, as I think, as he suspects, I will be writing. On the high income child benefit charge, which was noted by Baroness Lister, and I, I, I understand uh, where she is coming from and that she would like to uh, abolish it uh, completely. I suspect that that is probably not going to be on the table at this moment in time. Um, I also recognise the challenge that she raised, and, and I do, you know, and sometimes one has to go, okay, um, you know, changing from a, a principle in order to ensure we remove an unfairness can sometimes be okay. But that is why we are consulting on how that removal will take place, and I think it's going to be a very interesting uh, consultation. So continuing on the tax theme, the noble, my noble friend Lord Northbrook asked about tax-free shopping. The government's latest estimate for the cost of a new worldwide scheme, based on 2022 costings, is around £2.5 billion a year. Um, 
The Government is very grateful to the OBR for their review of the original costing of removing of tax-free shopping. We are considering the findings of the OBR alongside industry representations and broader data, so I very much encourage industry uh, to bring forward as many data points as they possibly can, and we will uh, consider them alongside the findings of the OBR. The Noble Lord, Lord Northbrook, also talked about inheritance tax. Um, my Lords, as I said, this was a budget very much focused on, 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 tax, on reducing taxes on work, so we were not able to make changes to the inheritance tax at this time. On multiple dwellings um, relief, I have listened to my noble friend, Lord Young, um, on this, uh, uh, and I will engage uh, and we will engage very closely with stakeholders to make sure that it doesn't have any unforeseen impacts um, I will raise the issue that he raised uh, back at the department and we will ensure uh, that we can do what we can now turning to um, the changes to uh, non-doms um, I welcome the welcome of my noble friend Lord Lee. Um, I agree with him that I think these changes are pragmatic. I think they achieve the right balance between ensuring those who are resident in the UK pay tax in the UK, but also encouraging those with high wealth to come to the UK and invest their, their funds. And that was the balance that we were very keen to achieve. We believe that introducing a new residence-based regime brings the UK into line with other countries who have similar schemes, such as France, Spain and Italy, and we are more competitive than places like Germany and the US that do not have these sorts of schemes. The detail of the operation of the scheme will become clear after consultation um, in due course. And I also recognise that there is uncertainty around um, the costing. The OBR has certified the costing as reasonable and central, um, but of course with any of these costings uh, some will uh, include more uncertainty than others. And as I note with, the Lord, with the, my noble friend Lord Northbrook, he uh, questioned the attractiveness of it. But I, I, I said previously, I do think that we are at the right level um, of, of attractiveness versus other places. So turning to um, public spending, um, I won't repeat the oft-quoted uh, government lines you know, on where we are with public spending. Of course, we absolutely recognise that we need good public services. We have committed to grow departmental spending 1% on average in real terms beyond 24-25. The, uh, the noble lady, Baroness Kramer, asked for a plan. Uh, as she knows, the plan will be set out um, in, in due course, and I will write with further if I can. We do believe that productivity um, must, not, must be part of, part of the plan. Uh, it too often um, it's, it's just an unfortunate feature of modern politics that the extent to which one is perceived to care about one public service or another is measured by how many millions, hundreds of millions, billions one is seen to be spending on it. In the private sector, that would be regarded as completely and utterly nonsensical. Nobody in the private sector we just increase inputs and just expect outputs to come flooding out. It doesn't guarantee the right outcomes. My Lords, we do need to take stock of this. It is vital that we change our attitude to become relentlessly focused on outcomes and not only inputs, because it's only by providing better public services um, that we can provide better value for money for the taxpayer. So um, many noble lords have mentioned the NHS productivity plan, and I would like to uh, commit to noble lords that we will hold uh, the NHS leadership's feet to the fire on this. They will be accountable for delivering the plan and for delivering its savings. And indeed, there's a further £800 million going into other public services, including special free schools, police technology, children's homes, justice system, DWP. Throughout all of those, the leadership will be uh, accountable for delivering the savings that they say they can get. The noble Lord Lord Macpherson, my noble friend Baroness Goldie, the noble Lord Lord Lee, my noble friend Lord Tugendhat all mentioned defence spending. Look, as the daughter of an army officer, I too uh, have a lot of interest in defence spending. I appreciate all of the comments on our armed forces and, and defence spending more broadly, and we recognise that we need our forces to be ready and resilient. So we remain committed to increasing defence spending to 2.5% of GDP as soon as conditions allow. And the 
It, and, we, and the Prime Minister has been clear that the target and the path for getting to that 2.5% will be set out at the next spending review. I will write to the Right Reverend Planet, Prelate on uh, official development uh, assistance. On the Household Support Fund, I take the, the comments from Noble Baroness Lady Listron, I will take those back, and from the, no, my noble friend Lord um, Young, I note his comments as well, but I will say that, that the Household Support Fund is just one of the many interventions that we can do to protect the most vulnerable. Um, I will write to various noble lords on the on local government funding. Um, there have been, you know, there, there, there have been pressures. The government has, st has stepped up to try and relieve those pressures. There have of also been some pretty poor decision making happening in some local government uh, uh, local governments, um, and, and, and the consequences of that is also sometimes coming through the system. I will write to the noble lord Lord Bird on social housing. Um, and to the Noble Sicker on reducing poverty, because I do want to just spend a couple of minutes, if I may, um, on infrastructure investment, which was mentioned by my noble friend Lord Howell. Um, infrastructure was also men mentioned by my noble friend Baroness Moyo, who focused on, on the effective, effective public and private infrastructure. And we absolutely recognise that high quality infrastructure is crucial for delivering economic growth, productivity, and competitiveness. And I welcome comments from my noble friend Lord Horham on investment across the UK, and potentially what we don't talk about enough, because it's not new, it's not, new, it's not a new thing. Um, but, but we are spending uh, £600 billion in public sector investment over the next five years. My lords, that's enormous. But of course, we, we don't talk about it because it's all there. There's a plan. It's all just going ahead. But actually, it's possibly worth reminding uh, 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 noble Lords, that, that this money continues to be spent. That's exactly where we are putting our money. <coughs> and we are speeding up the planning system for significant infrastructure products. We are looking at grid reforms, um, which will also be absolutely critical, particularly for the green economy as well. And on foreign direct investment, the UK has attracted the third highest amount of greenfield foreign direct investment since 2010, about £500 billion, behind only China and the US. And indeed, in that time, we have attracted more greenfield FDI than Germany and France combined. My Lords, we can attract uh, FDI, and Lord Harrington's review identifies how the government can go further, and we are taking that review very seriously. And of course, allied to that, we have to think about how we are going to not only unlock the pension, the money that's in our pensions, but also improve the functioning of our capital markets. The no my noble friend Baroness Moyo asked for specific plans, and I will write, her write to her with those specific plans, because of course a number of uh, uh, very esteemed experts within uh, the City of London have written good reports for us, and they, they build on the Edinburgh reforms and the Mansion House reforms, which the Chancellor has, um, uh, has already uh, announced. I will write to the noble Baroness Lady Bowles on, uh, on investment companies. Not much of an update yet, but I promise her I'm, I'm pushing, pushing it as much as I possibly can. Um, and in terms of the NatWest shares for schools mentioned by the noble Lord, Lord Lee, it is right that financial literacy is supported at a young age. The Chancellor did set out in his recent, recent letter that there would be really significant delivery challenges with gifting NatWest shares. Not entirely sure it's the right solution to a problem that I think he probably um, uh, recognises uh, is, is, is there. Um, but I would also say that um, the government is, is, is very committed to, to ensuring that uh, financial literacy is absolutely key. I will write to the noble Lord, Lord McPherson, about the NatWest retail sale. And apologies for not getting to that. And I will also write to the noble Baroness, Lady Sheehan, on the green economy, because actually I had quite a lot to say on that, particularly around the green finance strategy and how you align the financial system to investment in the green economy. Absolutely critical. To my noble friend, Lord Young, uh, um, the Chancellor made it clear at his TSE appearance last week that there were some unintentional leaks in the lead up to the budget. It is disappointing that not only for this fiscal event, but also for the last few fiscal events, it has been very difficult to keep a lid on measures. My Lords, I have absolutely overrun. I will send a letter, but to conclude, this spring budget is one more step in the Chancellor's clear plan to put us on a path to economic growth, and the next bill, also the subject of the debate in your Lordship's House this evening, ensures working people can feel the benefit of a tax cut as soon as possible. I beg to move.
The question is that the motion be agreed to. As many as are of that opinion will say content. The contrary not content. The contents have it. Second reading of the National Insurance Contributions Reduction in Rates Number 2 Bill, Baroness Veer of Norbiton. My Lords, I beg to move that the NI Thresholds Bill be read a second time. The question that this bill be now read a second time. As many as of that opinion will say content. Is the contrary not content? The contents have it. My Lords, I beg to move that this bill be committed to a committee of the whole House. The question is that this bill be committed to a committee of the whole House. As many as of that opinion will say content. Yeah. The contrary not content. The contents have it. My Lords, I beg to move that the House do now adjourn. That the House do now adjourn.